Um, first item we have is a review and approval of the minutes from our December 15, 2009 meeting. Uh, do, I, do I have any questions, comments, thoughts, changes? Hearing none, do I have a motion? Could I make a motion, please? Yes. Could I move that we accept the minutes as presented? Second. Uh, motion having been made and seconded, um, made by Beth Richardson, seconded by Barbara Schenkel. Any discussion on the motion to approve the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion? Seven nothing. That's good to hear. Uh, next item on the agenda is our, we uh, elect our offices at the first public hearing um, for calendar year 2010. Do I have any nominees? Could I? Oh. <laughs> I would like to move that Peter had to be reelected as chairperson. Second. Any other nominees? Yes. I'd like to nominate Beth Richardson second. for the vice chair. And we have a second on that. Any other nominees for vice chair? Hearing none, all in favor of the slate? Seven nothing. Thank you very much. I appreciate Congratulations. it. Congratulations. <laughs> It's a dynasty, like the Patriots. <laughs> um, first item on the uh, under all business is the Berry subdivision. If the applicant could step up to the microphone or their representative and make the present identify themselves first for our recording secretary and make a presentation, we'll consider it. Hi, I'm David Titcomb from Titcomb Associates here on behalf of uh, the state of Henry Berry. And uh, I also have with me Steve Bradstreet, who did the engineering on the project, and uh, Jim Logan from Albert Frick Associates. And my clients aren't here yet. Oh, there you are, over here. And uh, Steve Kander is the attorney for the estate. Um, we received some comments in the last meeting and uh, also comments from uh, your town engineer and we've addressed those in the plan. And let me see if I can do this. I'm having difficulty hearing you. Yeah. If you could speak up, I'm not sure if the microphone is picking up. Oh, okay. I'll speak louder. Thank you. That would be helpful. Is that the, where's the twist thing on this? Maureen, yeah. where's the twist on this? Oh, okay. Okay. Hey. Um, okay. Oops, bear with me. All right. Okay. Um, first of all, we've, um, there was a Hannaford Cove Road pavement is, uh, Hannaford Cove Road is narrow anyway. Uh, and a small portion of the pavement along here actually encroached onto the Berry property. Uh, and there are also a couple other encroachments too with culverts that crossed across the road. So upon, with discussions with staff and with um, um, the public works, uh, what we're proposing to do is to grant an easement along Hannaford Cove Road to, that will encompass the pavement and also it um, bows out, if you will, at a couple of locations to uh, include the culvert locations, including an area of large enough to take for maintenance of the culverts. Um, there are a couple other items too that were included in the memo. Uh, there was a, a water shutoff detail wasn't shown on the plans, which we'll add as a condition of approval. Uh, there was a 12 inch uh, corrugated plastic pipe culvert in this location in here. I can zoom in if you want, but it's right in that location that was not shown on the plans before and is now shown. Uh, there was some wording on the driveway perm permit. We said it shall be required, and, or, and now it says it will be required, or something to that effect. Uh, and there were also a number of erosion and sedimentation details that um, your town engineer asked to be added to the plans, and those are being taken care of. 
Uh, there was, um, in, we had proposed there was a, the, the pond lot that we referred to it as. Um, and from our discussions, it, it's become clear that that's not really a viable option. So uh, the applicants agreed to pay the open space impact fee uh, per Maureen's notes and her memo. Um, there was also a letter that we were provided from um, Mr. Egan and a letter to the project um, asking for restrictions on uh, roads in there. Um, and we understand the concerns of Mr. Egan, but feel that that's uh, an inappropriate restriction to be placed on the, the parcel at this time. If there was ever any development that happened in the future course of things, which is hypothetical at this point, then they would obviously need to come back to the planning board to have that discussion. Uh, so we just feel it's inappropriate. It's probably never happened before in other subdivisions, so I can't speak completely to that. Uh, but we ask that that not be considered as part of this application. Uh, and with that, I will answer any questions that the board may have. Oh, one other item, actually. Uh, late in the day today, I received a memo. Uh, some um, from the Conservation Commission asking that um, a septic system be located within, within the building envelope in a minimum of 25 feet from the RP2 wetlands. Um, if I can get back, how do I get back to the directory? You mean to the, to the, to another map. You want us to pick another one of those? Oh, you yeah. can. Okay. Go into the left corner with the buttons. Right here? Oh, okay. Click on it. There you go. There we go. Okay. Go to document and rotate. There you go. Okay. You can tell I don't use an apple. Okay. Uh, first of all, the first one septic system we're proposing right here, and their recommendation was that, that it be located within the building envelope. This obviously extends outside the building envelope. However, it meets all the setbacks required. You know, this is a, just a side setback issue and really is unrelated to the, to the wetlands. Um, this septic system right here, the septic system is um, well back from the RP2 wetlands here. However, there's additional wetlands right in this area here, the, you know, it's a very narrow channel that runs around here and goes into the larger one. And where we have the septic system proposed is 20 feet away. So um, we would just ask that, if, that all the, and the other systems are more than 25 feet away from the RP2. Um, we just ask that that be considered as part of this motion. And, um, and Jim Logan is here to discuss the septic system placement and such if anybody has any questions about that. Why would they be concerned about the building envelope? I certainly understand why they would be concerned. I, I don't know, understand the, the relevance of the building envelope at all, quite honestly. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, in the interest of disclosure, I also staffed the Conservation Commission, and I was there at the meeting where they were discussing this. I believe the reason they referred to the building envelope is that, uh, one, it's a simple way to determine where your setback is, one, and two, because um, even though you've shown septic systems that meet our state plumbing code and our local ordinances, you can move those septic systems to other locations following the planning board approval as long as the septic system design is redone and it gets the same approval. So unless there's some, some specific restriction by the planning board on where those septic systems can be moved to, um, they can float anywhere as long as they meet the state plumbing code and the town's uh, sewage ordinance. Right, but um, it's the two conditions they need there. And that's why they referred to the building perm the building envelope, because it controls, it's a good way of controlling that it stay away from the, sep the, from the wetlands. Because it does, it does indirectly do that. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, I mean, is there any? I'd, I'd just say, you know, if you want to lo locate the building envelope, then I would maybe just have it be as it relates to the location of the wetlands. 
because the difference being is that this one right here, see the wetlands are back here, and that's the nearest wetlands, but this just encroaches on the side set back here to lot one. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm still not sure I follow the logic on that issue, but. Well, the property line. How about lot three, though? Lot three, um, the issue over here is that this is really, and, and I can let Jim speak to the location of lot three, uh, but that's really the optimal location for the septic system right there. Why? <laughs> this is where I have to be on. If you could identify yourself for the record, please. What's that? I'm, identify I'm, yourself. I'm James Logan. I'm soil scientist and site evaluator, uh, septic designer with Albert Frick Associates uh, out of Gorham. And I worked on this uh, piece of property with Brady Frick. I didn't personally prepare the septic designs for this particular project. I mm -hmm. did uh, review the soils and the sites uh, and prepared the wetland delineation uh, mm -hmm. for the project. Uh, though I am a site evaluator and, and do septic system designs for a long time. Uh, Brady Frick is the boss's son, and he was out there and, and laid these out. Um, lot two and three particularly are somewhat shallow to bedrock soils, uh, and because of that, there's some limited flexibility in siting those systems. Uh, Maureen's correct. We, we've got to meet state standard otherwise and all the, the local ordinances. That one particular location on lot three, uh, near as I can tell, uh, and we, we do, we have the corner of the, the system is 21 feet to the edge of the wetlands. Um, I haven't been able to contact Brady. I'm just aware of this memo at the last minute sure. as to the ability to relocate that. At this point, I'm reluctant to suggest it's flexible and that it's easily relocated at this point. Um, I would point out to you that the, the wetland that's in question is this narrow finger that's at the outlet of a culvert, I believe, that's coming underneath the road. And quite frankly, if you look at the entirety of that wetland delineation, it kind of clips off there. If you went onto the other sheet, you could see how narrow a finger that entity really is and probably wasn't part of the original wetland system until the town installed the culvert at the, what was probably the convenient location and, and outletted a bunch of drainage and water into that little hollow that creates that, that narrow finger. Sure. It's really, a, while it is hydraulically connected to the overall wetland system, it's not really part of the bigger wetland system that's in the rear of the other lots, the bulk of the RP2 wetland. Uh, so I would submit to the board tonight that it's not necessarily equivalent to the rest of the RP2s, and we would only ask that consideration in that one location for lot three. So you're not as concerned about lot two? You think that's easily moved? Lot two, it's... it's to me, is, a, is immaterial. I, I picked up on what Maureen was suggesting from the board, but if lot two shows the appropriate wetland setbacks that, or, or you know, the, the applicants willing to provide for the board, there's no way that that system can drift anywhere near the wetlands, which I assume is their concern. I understand the general notion that they feel more comfort because it's more controllable within the building window. Right. But that sideline setback is a structure setback for buildings. It's not a setback for that has anything to do for septic. No, no, don't, don't confuse. Right. We're on the subject of septic. Right. The lot two site is nowhere near the wetlands and is, uh, is, is just slightly into the building setback, which is on the left-hand side of the lot as you face it. Uh, that particular instance there, their contention, I think, gets to be a little bit weaker because there's no issue over wetland protection in that particular location. Because it's so far away from it. Because it's, and, and because that lot indicates the 25 feet of buffer, that, you know, the setback that they're looking for on, on the rest of the subdivision, if you will. Um, so, so I personally have no concern over that particular lot. And I su would suggest to the board that the commission's concerns over wetland protection it's kind of moot in regards to uh, lot two. It's certainly valid for lot three. We wouldn't ask for any other consideration besides just that one site on lot three. Well, when you say consideration, you're saying leave it where it is, or if you can get back to us and say moving it four feet, which is... Four feet? Well, that's, that would bring it 25 feet away from the RP2. I, I True? Mean, I wasn't able to contact I the co-worker tonight to have a better sense of, of, of his notion of flexibility. Sure. Uh, 
I'm reluctant to suggest it can be done because I don't I don't know that for certain. And you just this came out uh, a week ago, right? Yeah, but I just was in receipt oh, of it because that, we just it got came out this afternoon. That's fine. It's dated the thirteenth. Right. You just saw it. I I, just I, I certainly understand that. I'm, um, right. And again, I, I go back to the idea that although the little finger that handles the culvert outlet drainage from underneath the road that the Department of Public Works put in is in fact a wetland that meets the three parameter definition per Army Corps of Engineers delineation manual the way we delineate all wetlands. Sure. I would submit to the board that it's not synonymous with the rest of the bigger wetland system that's to the rear of the building sites which is more in keeping with what I, I think the Conservation Commission would really be concerned about protecting this this little narrow finger is is, is is not synonymous it's not on the same elevation as the wetland to the rear it's it's actually elevated a little bit higher and drains down over the ledge um, before it hits the bigger piece of wetland system some people might have even said it was just a drainage ditch or a runoff and wouldn't have delineated around it but it does meet the three parameter uh litmus test it's just not and this is where the Army Corps manual has us delineating all wetlands in similar fashion, no matter what type of wetlands they are, whether they're critical wetlands right. or, or RP2, as in this case. So. And, and your obli obligation for the subdivision ordinance is to show that you can put a system. Correct. Correct. You know, per your ordinance. And, and, and the town, there's relatively few towns that want to see full septic system designs for planning board approval. We typically only provide a box on a plan that says this is a location that meets the standard and sure. we don't provide a design because people haven't come to us with a given number of bedrooms and so forth. In, the, in terms of Cape Elizabeth reviews, for years we have been producing septic designs. Sometimes they become utilized for building permits. Sometimes they call us back for a relocation or a different number of bedrooms and, and we act accordingly. So. Well, given that, it seems if it can be located somewhere else, that would be something that would be fairly easy to do. Other than the fact that we've got about two feet of snow, or two and a half feet, you know, two feet of snow out there, maybe 18 well, feet Well, I'm uh, talking about right now. Correct. Correct. Okay. Is the applicant done its uh, presentation? Yes. Okay. Any questions of the board of the applicant's presentation before I open it up for public hearing? Okay, I'd like to open the uh, public hearing for the Berry subdivision and invite anyone that wishing to speak concerning the proposed minor subdivision. Step up to the microphone, identify yourself, and the board will consider your comments. Good evening. Uh, members of the planning board, nice to be in front of you again. Some different item. Uh, my name is James Wagner from Hannaford Hill Road, number 30. Um, just a couple of issues. I, I've, I've looked over uh, a copy of the, the plans uh, that are posted on the board over there. And I, I guess I would state my concerns as, um, categorize them as four different concerns. Uh, one would be the wetlands issue, which uh, the soil scientist was just describing. And one of my concerns would be, um, first of all, I've never reviewed the, the uh, wetlands assessment, which I assume there was, was done in this, so I, I'm speaking without having reviewed that material. But um, query whether RP2 is the designation for the entire four lots and whether or not there's total compliance with the setbacks uh, for an RP1 designation. I know at my house, number 30, behind our house is clearly a saturated wetland for the entire year. And although the soil scientists described that he uh, uh, thought that maybe the, where the culvert was coming across the street, I don't know if he was talking about at lot number two or uh, the lot near my house, but the lot near my house, if, if you're familiar with the street, it's clear that that's a natural estuary coming from the wetlands across the street where the culvert is. It was placed where the natural flow came from the wetland. Um, and with due, due respect to the soil scientists, the fact that he wasn't able to contact his coworker today 
um, I think it bears further scrutiny and that we do contact coworkers when you're talking about wetland resources and the impact on the aquifers in the area. Um, especially with the, uh, the lot across from my house, I know that the, there'll be an elevation and draining towards the wetlands, and there is substantial wetlands directly behind my house, to the left of my house, and going across the street to my house. Can I ask you what lot you're talking about? I think lot it might four. be a lot four. It's huh? across from lot four. four. Yeah. It's out. Right. Uh, this, what plan is that? And uh, I note that the building envelope on lot four is extremely large, so that allows the uh, developer to place their septic field according to what, if I understand more correctly, uh, pretty, pretty much anywhere within that building envelope minus 25 feet. No. No. That's not what the proposed restriction is. It's got to be inside the building envelope, and it has to be 25 feet from RP2 wetlands. But they also still have to comply with the state and local ordinances to make sure it works where they want to put it. So, and that's really the first criteria. It has to, uh, it has to work. That, that may further restrict where these things go, but they've done a plan and the minimum obligation under the subdivision ordinance is to show us they can put one on each site, which they've done. And, and we're asking, the Conservation Commission is asking us to impose a little bit more of a restriction on it to ensure that it's a little further away from the RP2 and indirectly stay within the building envelope, which is not part of the state or local ordinance requirements. So we certainly have the right to do that. I'm just trying to find out whether it's, it gets us anywhere. Right. So. And the, uh, the final com comment about I do, I do think that their point was, on lots, for lot four, it doesn't make a difference because they, I feel flexible enough that they, they're not that close now. But lot three and two, as they identified, have some concerns and they're asking for some flexibility on two. In fairness to the applicant, in terms of not getting be able to get a hold of his associate, they just got this today. We, we, I just saw it 10 minutes ago. And this is the? The recommendation from the Conservation Commission. OK. All right. I oh. think he's questioning the delineation of RP2 on right. lot four. OK. So if, if that that's, is the that's, case, that, that's correct. the septic is uh, an issue on lot four. OK. It, it is an initial question that we should pose is whether or not that's a correct designation. If it's not an RP2, then there's an issue with the, the site plan as described. Um, the, um, the, the other point, I don't know whether, what's the, the rule in Cape Elizabeth, but my understanding is some towns might have a peer review mm. of a soil scientist or a geological survey like this. Yeah, we, we have that right to, to ask for that. And so that may be something we're going to consider. But it, it might be appropriate. I mean, I'm sure uh, I'm not questioning the integrity of the soil scientist at all, but he is under the, he's being paid by the applicant. And that's why we have the right to ask that it be reviewed. Uh, the other concern uh, that I wanted to discuss was the same one that was uh, stated in a letter by my neighbor, Mr. Egan, and that's concerning Dr. Holt's property. And uh, I, I don't know because the, apparently it's not something that the, the lawyer for the applicant was willing to discuss. Uh, about what the plans are, whether or not there's been any discussion with, with Dr. Holt about what the plans are for any road, if there are any plans, uh, subsequently. We do not, I, I think I speak on behalf of, of the street that we do not want Hannaford Cove to be uh, a passway street, a uh, pass-through street from Broad Cove or other communities uh, to the north. and. Uh, we, uh, I'm a father of three young children. I'm concerned about traffic implications. I'm concerned, frankly, about even a driveway across the street from me. But, uh, you know, within uh, whatever the powers are uh, of the planning board, that we, I, I think that is something that we shouldn't ignore, uh, Mr. Egan's letter, and that it's, it's worth looking into and considering whether or not there are plans and if the applicant has had discussions with Dr. Holt about any such plans. The uh, third issue I, I thought about, and I'm sure some of my neighbors share with me, is uh, the question of lighting on the street. And currently, the only uh, public light pole is way down by, I believe, Steve Peterson's house. And there's no other lamp post sort of lighting. And I think our street likes it that way. Um, so I don't know if the applicant is planning on putting lighting, but that would be something that I, I think we all would object to. Um, and finally, uh, just generalized safety concerns that I have as a father of three children. 
two-year-old, a five-year-old, and an eight-year-old who play outside every day, as Patty can attest to. She sees them playing all the time. Um, they, it's tough enough with that street with con, you know, contractors coming down to work on our various houses, landscapers in the summertime uh, exceeding the speed limit on that street. And um, I, I had to chase down a contractor um, this summer who was a, a, a flatbed with all sorts of stuff on the back end, just flew by my house and my little girl was outside. And I, you know, I went running down the street and said, hey, listen, there's kids on the street. We don't drive like that. If we're going to have a subdivision with four different lots being worked on, that's a very serious concern uh, about how we address uh, contractors, subcontractors, and how, how you keep them from uh, imperiling the life of children. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Step right up. You don't have to raise your hand. Please identify yourself. My name is Farm Spraff with a 69 Hanover Co Road, which is on the same side as the proposed subdivision, but further down. Um, <clears throat> with respect to one issue which I hadn't, in fact, been aware of, as to whether this area could be used as an access, a traffic access at some time in the future to backlands, I would be really concerned about that. I share the last speaker's concern about Hannaford Cove becoming a byway, and, and those are just as an aside. I share his feeling about the lighting. I've had no contact with him. I haven't missed, met Mr. Wagner before, but I think he spoke fairly when he said there was a sort of a neighborhood consensus on these points. But my concern is, is more general, and it may not be apropos, but I was concerned when I heard Mr. Brady. Is it Mr. Brady? I'm sorry. Mr. Okay, Mr. Logan. Um, say, well, that little area right off Hannaford Cove Road wasn't really a wetland. It was only it looked more like a storm drain. Or Was that my understanding? It was not as specific. Hey, if you could address your comments to the board. I'm sorry. I will invite the applicant to respond to some of the concerns, but we, we want to hear clearly what they are. So that we well, can my concern most clearly is that my land backs on, I believe, a critical wetland. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell, because there doesn't seem to be a general um, hydrology study from the map that I could see, which I saw just tonight. Mm -hmm. The watershed in the back there is extremely complex. I can't tell, looking at that, whether any of it drains towards Hanapakoa Road or if it all drains up towards Two Lights Road. Um, it's not possible for me to tell. But I know that the wetlands in back of me have undergone some real changes, that they're riding higher. I can't tell if it's the runoff is smaller, if something has happened to the drain, but I am concerned that anything which might inhibit the operation of those wetlands, and because obviously there's development about to happen all around these wetlands, I would like to see some of these things viewed in a larger context because I really think the hydrology is complex. And if we do it site by site, little unit by little unit, we'll suddenly find that the water system has changed and we didn't see it coming. And that is my primary point. Thank you for hearing well, I have a question for you. You used the phrase that, that the wetlands seem to be riding higher. It's rising higher. Rising higher. And, yes. and since when's the before and after? <coughs> you I, am, I am aware of this over the past two years. Two years. I have a shed in the back of mine, which always had some water under. Mm -hmm. So we replaced the shed. It burned down and was rebuilt. Mm -hmm. And we built it higher. It's now in the winter, or during the wet period, it's coming up almost to the same height that it used to. I know almost exactly in my yard where the water came up to the year that we had the big flood in Portland. Do you seven. recall that? There was a big flood in Pat Portland. Patriot State storm? No, 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 no. This is maybe... 12 years ago? 96. Anyone help me out? Yeah, 96. 96, right, thir uh, whatever that is, 13 years. And I know almost precisely where the water in my yard came to. It comes up there routinely now. Um, I saw it in the summer. I'm getting drainage water standing on either side of my yard that I never did before. Uh, Paul, my neighbor to, on, the, on the ocean side, what's Paul's second name? Nielsen. Paul Nielsen was worried because his water in the basement 
He's had the house for more than 20 years and it never happened. Eileen is having wet driveway problems. And, and my immediate neighbor on the side away from Paul is having problems with wet in the driveway. The driveway's is subsiding or something. I think something is changing in the water system, in the, in the way the hydrology works. But I don't know enough about it. I'm just concerned when I say piecemeal things. Sure. Um, that's my concern. And how long have you lived in your home? Well, 15 years, I would guess. And, and you're saying that you've noticed more significant changes over the there last There has three been years. a change over the last two or three years. The first time, I thought it was just a very wet summer. Mm -hmm. But it's not that. Last summer was wet, but it wasn't that wet. And I have water standing between me and Paul, which used to only happen in the spring thaw. Now it's happening in the summer. What number is yeah, 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 69. 69. Where are you in relation to Mr. Egan? Same side of the street? Same side of the street. How, far, how much farther down are you? Uh, quite a long way down. Um, I'm two houses up from Rocky Point Road. I see. I face into the, where the pond is on the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. you, if you know it. No, you I know, know it very well. Okay. Anyway, th thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Reed Gramsey. Uh, my family and I live at 12 Cunner Lane, which is accessed through Hanford Cove Road. My first question is, I, I, I didn't quite understand the purpose of the subdivision uh, uh, giving away five feet of right-of-way to the road. I didn't understand, was that because the road was in the wrong spot initially? And I guess the gist of my question is I would be concerned, and this has to do with what Florence and Jamie said, if the town owns more five feet of the road, does that in any way uh, show an interest in the town of widening on the road? And, and I share again my neighbor's concerns about the effect of widening, widening the road on the traffic pattern and the speed of people going down the street. Well, I don't, I don't think the suggestion is anybody's going to widen anything. I think the offer by the applicant, and correct me if I'm wrong, is to allow the town to have an easement five feet into their project to maintain the culverts that are being installed as part of the project. And, and That's actually something we routinely might get, but Maureen can maybe not. The culverts are not, no culverts are being proposed to be installed. Okay. They exist. exist oh, they exist already? Yes. Okay. This is the part of the public works. Uh, yes. to, to maintain the roads? No. It, it, according to the survey that the applicant has submitted, it appears that a portion of the traveled surface of Hannaford Cove Road may be on the applicant's property. So the portion that's paved that people are driving on may in fact not be within the right of way. It's a very old road. The right of way is very old as well. So it's possible that we could spend a significant chunk of money and do a very good quality right of way survey of Hannaford Cove Road and find out that in fact it's not encroaching on the applicant's property. Is that fair, Mr. Titcomb? It's possible. Maybe. But we, we think we have the right of way in the right location. It's I, just right. roads being over time. And instead of trying to correct this, we're looking at a low cost option I see. where the applicant gives us something and we don't have to move the road. Thank you. That was their offer, right? Or did you ask for that? We agree. <laughs> we agree. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm just trying to understand what happened. I, I, my name is Richard Berman. I live at 58 Hannaford Cove Road. And uh, well, first of all, um, I think you got the A team working on this. Mr. Titcomb says uh, his office does a survey. Usually it's correct. So um, <laughs> my question, I guess, on, and, and by the way, um, as far as the wetlands, Al Frick seems uh, to be the, uh, the expert. He's done my mapping and he kind of knows the systems on this. So I'm going to assume that's all correct because we're pretty good professionals. I guess my question is on that five foot easement is would that be, why don't they deed it to the town? So we own it. Or would that affect the. Yeah. I think I know the answer. The, the original request was for a deed. The offer that was reciprocated was an easement. The price was right. We thought it was a good opportunity. Why don't we save all the applicants' responses? If you could just delineate them all, I know you'll have a few. And what I'll do is we'll go through all the 
public comments. So that's one. And invite the applicant to respond to them and hopefully get a dialogue going among the board. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so whether it's an easement or a deed, I guess it does the same thing. But right. if it's a deed, it's much stronger. Um, I understand the concerns of my neighbors about uh, road cutting through, but I agree with the applicant. It's not shown on the plan. If anybody wanted to do that, I believe it would have to come back to the to the board and would be all up in arms against it. I do believe in smart growth. I do believe in interconnected roads, but the whole traffic thing wants to go the other way. So I'd be against that too. But I agree with the applicant. I don't think it has to be a condition because it's it'll have to come back to the board anyway. Um, it sounds like they're paying an impact fee. Um, is and I'm, one of my questions to the board is, uh, you know, we as neighbors are going to have more people and more traffic and all that. I'm wondering if there's a way that the impact fee can be stipulated to be spent within the neighborhood in open space acquisition as opposed to anywhere in town. Um, maybe you can pay for a sign that says Hannaford Cove Road that we don't have anymore. <laughs> Make a note to the public works department. On that. <laughs> I'm assuming there's no waivers in this zone, the setbacks. Uh, so I think, and as far as like the setbacks on the septic, I agree with the applicant on that. I don't see the correlation between the building setback and the uh, septic setback. In other words, if they can meet the Pullman code and all the codes of the town, so be it. And uh, they should have the flexibility. They don't know what size house is going to go on it, as, as they said. So I support them on that. Lighting on the street, you know, <laughs> we can see the night sky. We want to keep doing that. So I don't think there's any street lights proposed, but I think a lot of us would be uh, very against it. One other question I have is, do these new uh, uh, lots, do they have access to the private beach, Staples Cove Beach? And I don't know if anybody here can answer that, but I'm sure that, that would be a title issue, and that's clearly not our. But it might be somebody that knows. Daily work. So, <laughs> so those are the things. Otherwise, I think you've got a good team. Um, there's issues. I'm assuming if the wetlands are mapped correctly, and I assume they are, that they're meeting all the things, and they don't need easements. And uh, so, you know, the no street lights. I think everybody heard that. You know, we don't want to cut through roads there. Um, and I'm curious about that uh, beach access. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak concerning the application? Uh, my name is Eileen Calico, and I live at 53 Hannaford Cove Road, and I have a, been a resident of Hannaford Cove Road since uh, 1979. Um, so I have had the privilege of living in a rural, um, unique uh, part of Cape Elizabeth, and I have seen both the changes and the not changes uh, transpire on our road. Um, I would like to reiterate my concern about wetlands, having lived on Hannaford Cove Road for 30 years, and. Uh, that I requested the board to take seriously the um, issue of where septic systems are in relationship to the wetlands. Um, I would echo what one of my neighbors has said, that the wetlands which are not viewed um, beyond the maps in question exist from the beginning of Two Lights Road all the way to the end um, of Hannaford Code Road, where, the, where it intersects with Rocky, Rocky Knoll, Rocky Lake, I don't even know, Rocky Lane, thank you. And that um, it is behind all of our homes that are on the side of the development. And the flow of water, in fact, is an issue, um, whether it goes under Hannaford Cove Road, through our lots, be it either in the back or in the front and that uh, water quality, um, we all have septic systems which on our roads since there is no public sewer. Many of us still have wells and I did not hear any mention of public water or um, connection to the public water system. 
which I think also is an issue, and the um, piping that you mentioned by the Portland Water District on the five-foot easement is summer water for many of the residents, <coughs> and I don't understand or would like to know um, if that is being taken into account as well in terms of planning, um, both for where the septic systems reside on the uh, lots as they are proposed, and also in relationship to um, driveways, cut-throughs, whatever. I'm sorry. What was your comment about sum summer water? Uh, capable, capable, incapable is that some people have wells. Uh -huh. And in the summertime, on, at least on Hannaford Cove Road, since the time that I have lived there and ongoing, do you have summer water? Excuse me, it does. No, it's all right. It's because it's we, turned on and on. I make a comment. I'm happy to hear it, but yeah. you've got to step up to the microphone yeah. so we can get it on the record. But, so go ahead. We have the opportunity to have um, Portland water from the Portland Water District, yeah. which is turned on in early spring, turned off in late fall. There are places along the road where the access to that water is turned on and on. It still exists. And so you use your well for the rest of the year? Yes. And then you get the water from Portland? The water, yes. In the summer? Correct. Okay. 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 All set? I am. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Good evening. My name is Tim Norton, and I'm an attorney. I represent Tom Egan. As you can tell from the plan, is a direct abutter to the east, I think, of the property. Um, a couple of issues that Mr. Egan asked me to raise tonight, um, some of which you've seen in his letter. The first issue is regard to the, set, uh, the, the setbacks. Uh, I was just curious, on lot four, there appears to be a 25-foot setback from the wetland line that is maintained on the entire building envelope until it gets to the area right um, near where the proposed septic is shown, and then you can see that up at the building envelope all of a sudden runs could, right along the weapons line. Could you speak louder? Yeah, I'm, I'm having difficulty. I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm sorry. Yeah. If you have the plan for lot four, proposed lot four, yeah. you can see the wetlands delineation line, and then the building envelope line. Yep. Yeah. And there's a 25 foot setback maintained through most of that area, but as it approaches Hannaford Cove Road, the setback disappears, and all of a sudden the building envelope appears to run right along the wetlands delineation line. Where is that? Is that my right plan? Here. Right here. Okay. Right there, Peter. Right. It's along near the road. This is right Where does it run along? Oh, I see what you're saying. This is, this is the 20th. We talked about that before, I guess. Okay. I, I see. So that, that, that's a question, I guess, more than anything else, why that is. And obviously, if that's a, a significant area and we're maintaining a 25-foot setback, why shouldn't it be throughout? Um, secondly, I guess I would echo, uh, and I would say that Mr. Egan is, is not on record opposed to the subdivision. Um, he, he just wants to make sure that the uh, project, if it moves forward, is moved forward carefully. And with regard to that, uh, wetlands is certainly a key issue. So I think I would, I would echo on his behalf the idea of a peer review. Um, this is a significant, the, the area that is encompassed by this wetland appears to exceed an acre. And so it, it seems to me it, it's at least close to the line of what would be a um, RP1 line. So um, it seems to me, given the importance of this wetland, that that's a significant enough issue to make sure we get it right. Uh, if it's right, then it's right, and that's fine. But it, it seems to me it's not something we should rush by. Uh, the final issue, and pro probably the most significant one to Mr. Egan, is the one he raised in his letter, and that is this crossroad. And I, I fully understand that the board's position may be 
that that's an issue for another day. Uh, our position is it's not an issue for another day, that, that this is, as a matter of policy, it's a better time to talk about it. And maybe it's not a time to resolve it, but it's a time to talk about it. Um, the ordinance, the, the subdivision ordinance says that uh, part of the issue is to, part of the findings to make is that the subdivision will not cause an unreasonable road congestion, uh, congestion uh, with regard to the project alone or in conjunction with existing or contemplated road use. And so our question is, is there a contemplated road use? Um, there, our understanding is there have been at least some thoughts about that, perhaps some discussions about that, and if, if, if this applicant is going to be selling off lots to people. They deserve to know if there is going to be a crossroad running in, along the edge of their properties. Uh, and I think Mr. Egan and his neighbors deserve to know that as well. And I suspect that it's something that, if in fact there's a serious consideration of a road running through this lot with the combination of the wetlands issues that we've already talked about, uh, there, there ought to at least be a serious discussion about what that would mean and whether or not now is the time to put that on the table, perhaps attach conditions to this approval to, if the board thinks that that's a bad idea, then, you know, it's not a bad idea to discuss it today and perhaps put that condition on this project. So, can, I, so, can I ask you a question about that? Sure. Go ahead. Um, the, the first time this was raised is when the planning board got Mr. Egan's letter, and it was a comment out of nowhere for us. There is no proposed right of way or road on any of the lots, on any of the plans. We've been in workshops, we've been in sessions with the applicant, it has never been raised. We did a full site walk of the entire property. Nothing is staked, nothing's been raised. But this keeps coming up from Mr. Egan. Now it's been suggested at other, I think at a workshop, that this may be a a ploy of Mr. Egan's to try to lessen the value of the property so he can get it at a bargain, which I hold with as much validity as I do the mysterious letter that arose from Mr. Egan about this mysterious road that's going to go through. Could you please explain to us where this is all coming from? I keep hearing about there may have been talked about, it might have been thought about, but we are, at least I am, and I think I've been with everybody for the, all of these meetings, we are clueless because everything that's presented to us says nothing other than the development of three house lots in addition to the existing home as the fourth. And, and I would add one more fact to that, that the developer has told us repeatedly there are no plans, there are no discussions That's an excellent that. point. I mean, we asked that directly during and, the workshop. And, and assuming all that, what authority would we have to impose any kind of condition you know, on, on something they're not even asking for? But could you, could you please give us some sense of where this Absolutely. is coming from, please? Yeah, I'd actually like to do that because I think this is an issue that Mr. Egan's concerned about as well because that suggestion has been made by other people. Mm -hmm. I mean, let me tell you exactly the way this developed. Mr. Egan has expressed repeatedly through me and directly to the estate that he has an interest in, in making sure that a crossroad through that lot doesn't occur. He has no interest in buying that lot as a lot, and he has expressed that in most recently in a letter directly to uh, the estate. Now, where does, where does the, the, the thought come from? Have the Holtz talked about selling it? I mean, where does this whole, or does he just look at this and go, uh-oh, uh, don't want a, a road there? I, I think it's, it's a relatively common discussion in the neighborhood that that is a, the only meaningful location for a crossroad to the whole property, uh, and that it the is. Holtz, the, to the Holtz property? Yes. Uh, and that it is an area that would be, um, uh, would, would obviously, would be significant concern to certainly Mr. Egan and uh, as well as his neighbors. Uh, I don't think it's a secret on Hannaford Cove Road that that's what everybody has understood as being a real possibility. Um, but how is that any more possible than than a developer going to buy Ms. Calico's lot or one of the other people that I just happen to remember your name uh, who, who spoke already? I mean, it, yeah. it, there's no way for us. I just don't see it. Well, I think I think all the people you indicated would more than happy to sign a, a covenant saying that they wouldn't do that. I think the, the well, point that, is that they're voluntarily voluntarily agreeing to that. We're talking about a government agency, meaning us, yeah. asking a developer for condition that, on something that's possible maybe in the future. Well, and, and and I can guarantee you this: any such proposal will absolutely come back to at least this board, if not other boards in town, depending on the project's proposal. 
So and my I view is, 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 I, is, I understand that. I certainly understand Mr. Egan's idea to put it on the table and let's hash it out. But I, I'm, I don't see any rule or authority that would allow us to do that if the developer simply says, I'm sorry, I'm not interested in granting that right now. And if you can show me something in the subdivision ordinance that gives us, I think that contemplated language you quoted a little while ago is for what's being proposed today, which is three, lot, three additional lots on Hannaford Cove Road. Okay, and if they were showing a right away reservation, I think you've got something, because now they're showing a reservation. It's not happening. No, and I understand, and I started off by saying I understand if the board may take the position that that's an issue for... Well, I'm asking, I'm, I'm, I'm inviting you to point to something to beyond what you're saying that might allow us to, the authority to do that. And, and what I'm hearing back is you really don't have anything, but you're... Well, I, I, I think my answer back is in, in Section 16.1.1 of the ordinance, mm -hmm. you have the right to protect the various aspects of this, of this pro, uh, the property, including... Uh, if you deem, and you may not, but if you deem a road crossing through this lot, through this wetland area, through this very narrow mouth, uh, as a potential risk to the, to the property and the abutting lot owners and, and the, the uh, wetland area, then I think you have the absolute right in your discretion to put conditions on that you deem necessary to protect those, uh, you know, those various property rights. But they're not proposing to do I'm not saying you have to. I th I'm saying I think you have that authority. Okay. And I'm also saying that you, you've all seen scenarios before um, where uh, properties are developed and there is a hidden agenda. And I don't know if there is or not. I'm not suggesting that. I'm saying we've all seen scenarios where three years from now, right. suddenly this lot, this road that nobody talked about appears and the lot owners that, have, that bought these three lots say, hey, wait a minute. It's not going to appear. It's going to come before the board. I understand. I understand. As a, but by then... As, as a proposal. You won't see asphalt on the ground before right. all these abutters get notice but, again. But by that point, two people have, or two or three people have purchased lots out there with the understanding that, that the lot next to them is a residential lot. Um, well, that, if that changes, it may be too late. Well, for that, yeah, that's a subdivision issue, and you could put... Those buyers could insist that that's part of their subdivision restrictions before they buy it. And I understand that that's their call, but you, you know and I know that somebody's going to come before you and say, well, wait a minute, you know, we bought this thinking that what we were seeing on the subdivision plan was a single family home, and now you're telling me it may be a road. Yeah. And you're going to say, because uses, you have to, uses can always bad, change the ordinance. with approvals. I, I do want to close out, and I, I know I've taken a lot of time. I, I want to close out. Mr. Egan wanted to make it very clear that this is not, he's not playing a game with you or with the applicant. He has no interest in purchasing this lot as a lot. He has every interest in acquiring or protecting those rights and doing whatever it takes to make sure that that doesn't get developed into a road. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a question oh, sure. before he sits down? I'm gathering from what you're saying that you have a sense of where that road would be because you keep talking about the lot, the narrow opening, and in your mind, there's a place where it fits. I'm looking on the plan of these four lots, and I'm seeing wetland all across there, and finding a hard time figuring out, realistically, even where a road could go in this area. So if the neighborhood, as conveyed to you, has an idea of where it would be, it would be helpful if you could give us a sense of that. I think the sense is that if there is any realistic possibility, it is over proposed lot four. Um, On the far right hand end of it? Yes. Maureen, we, uh, there are no, I think we talked about this, there are no setbacks, or Peter, for a road, there's no wetland setbacks to a road, is there? I think we talked about this. I, I, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you. No, there isn't. You, you cannot construct a new road over an RP1 wetland or in an RP1 buffer. You can reconstruct an existing road in an RP1 or an RP1 buffer. Uh, you can build a road in an RP2 wetland only with the permission of the planning board. You have to get a permit and you have to, use, you have to show the usual minimizing the impact on the wetland, no other alternative those types of standards. Okay. Which, which I, I would just point out, that's probably all the more reason to make sure we get the designation of wetlands correct for purposes of this plan. Oh, I'm, that's a totally different issue to me. Than I, your proposal. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Or Mr. Egan's proposal. Anyone else wishing to speak concerning this three lot subdivision? 
Anyone else wishing to speak? Second call. Anyone else wishing to speak? I'll close the public hearing and invite the applicant to address uh, some of the concerns that the uh, neighbors have raised. Hi, I'm Steve Canders, and uh, I'm the attorney for the estate. Uh, Henry Berry was my friend. He was your neighbor. And when Henry came to me and he recognized that his property was worth something to his children, and he put it specifically in his will that the property would be developed within the strictures of all applicable land use ordinances to the greatest extent possible. That's why I'm here. That's why this plan is here. There has been a comment made by one of the neighbors that uh, for some reason the attorney for the estate hasn't said something. Uh, I don't know that gentleman. He's never asked me anything, but let me be very clear. There have been expressions of interest in this property, mm -hmm. including from Mr. Norton in behalf of Mr. Egan. Everyone who has inquired has been told wait, it's too soon. We want to get subdivision approval so that there are marketable lots. And the plan is very simple. Get the plan approved, market the lots. Mm -hmm. That's all we want to do. And uh, I would also point out, since, it's, since this ball has been put in play, uh, that the, uh, you folks do have the power to say to us, we insist that you reserve a road over this property for abutting land. You have that authority under the ordinance. Uh, I can specifically tell you under the subdivision regulation. Specifically, uh, 1631A, the board may require. Please. 16, page, page 16. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't have the page. Oh, 16. Page I'm sorry. 16. I have the wrong ordinance. Yep. Sorry. Uh, the board may require provision for the protection of roads or for access to adjoining property, whether subdivided or not. Well, I mean, quite clearly, you could tell us we insist as a condition that you reserve access. Uh, I'm not sure you could tell us you can't, but we don't care. We're not interested in doing that. We're interested in having four residential lots to put on the market to create three new homes on the other side of a road where presently there are ten homes already down to that point. That's all we want to do is have you folks let us put three new homes on that road. That's all we're asking for. That's all I have. I think that thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll answer a couple of um, points here, and then I'm going to I'll let Jim speak to the last sure. issue. Uh, first of all, we are not proposing any street lights on the street at all. Um, second of all, the um, why were we granted uh, easement and not a deed? Uh, chances are probably pretty good that the town of Cape Elizabeth doesn't own Hannaford Cove in fee. So the chances are probably very good that, that there's a public easement that exists over Hannaford Cove Road sure. and that the public owns to the center of the road. So this would be just consistent with the current use as well instead of giving it a fee. Um, and other than that, Jim, do you want to speak to the RP2? Yes, I would love to. There seems to be a question over a designation of wetlands here, RP1 versus RP2. Uh, I, I would not have represented to Titcomb Associates or our client, Mr. Berry, that these were RP2 if they were in fact RP1. I, the board probably is aware of some of the designation differences for the purposes of the, the, the people in the audience. Very strictly speaking, in order to be a critical wetland in the first place, it not only has to meet all the, the parameters of the Army Corps of Engineers manual, but it's got to be composed of very poorly drained soils. This is a, a technical classification for soil that says that the water table is always at, the, at the, the ground surface or above the mineral surface, 
And in order to have it in the first place, you have to have an organic deposit that's not mineral soil at all, that's a, at, at a minimum of six inches and, and anything beyond that. You've got to have a mucky peat type of soil. Your ordinance has always done a great job of protecting those kinds of wetlands that should never have construction in them. That's why you can't build a new road in an RP1. You can re rebuild an old one. And why you've got to have special permission even in RP2. RP2 wetlands are mineral soils. They have a bottom. They have some stability. RP1s don't have stability, and they shouldn't be fooled with. And the big ones, and that's what makes your 250-foot setback, they have to be a minimum acreage in order to make that designation as critical wetland one, or what was known as RP1. Uh, in the case of the Berry property, there's actually a man-made pond within the wetland system, which has a very small area around it of very poorly drained soils. And, and uh, in order to prepare this plan, and prior to this designation as RP2, uh, I did a fairly extensive uh, examination of the soils, as well as the wetland delineation. I had uh, seven or eight soil borings in there uh, beyond the septic sites. These were soil observations just within the wetland areas. And then I approached uh, uh, Bruce Smith, the code enforcement officer, who generally is the one for guidance in that portion of the ordinance where one needs to clarify the type of wetland that it is. And I, I met with Bruce and we, we extensively considered this information and I, I left his office with him and telling me it's RP2. So that, that's how we got RP2 on the plan. You can continue to second guess, you can go ahead and call for peer reviews. I would wonder then why people scratch their heads and think that land is so expensive in Cape because it doesn't seem to matter that you're licensed by the state and that you do good work. You can still have to pay for a peer review once you've already paid somebody who's licensed to do the work. Um, but rest assured, careful consideration of this wetland system uh, took place before it, it got its RP2 designation. Uh, in terms of the woman that spoke before, uh, I've worked extensively down Hannaford Cove Road, in, including the critical wetland that's on the opposite side, and I can speak to that as well. And the plan prepared by Tiffin does a real nice job of showing the direction of flows from all those culverts, and they are all towards Two Lights Road. None of the drainage on this property heads underneath Hannaford Cove Road and back to the other side. Uh, this subdivision makes no proposal for any wetland impact whatsoever. So I would submit to the people that are concerned about drainage and backed up water in underneath their sheds and so forth, that this is going to have un unobstructed flow, that, that nothing's going to happen here to cause backing up across the street. This is going to be, the, the desire here is to let the, the drainage continue unabated through the lot, as it always has. Uh, I think the woman who identified that particular issue was on the same side, though. Yeah. Well, farther and down, well, quite, quite, and, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm not that, engaging, I'm just trying no, to correct that's fine. Okay, maybe I misunderstood that. In, in that case, I, I had the impression some of the people are on the opposite no, side. I, I the gentleman was talking That's about. true, I'm, and I'm, but, just, but, I'm trying to clarify that one issue. But, but she is, her. excuse me, she is quite a ways down. She's at 60, I believe. It's, is that the 69, 69, 69, even further. Than that. Right, and I would suggest to you, if you know Hannaford Cove Road, this is all downhill of where her piece of wetland is, so that there's nothing that can occur here, I believe, particularly with no wetland impacts proposed, that would cause worse drainage situations to occur in, on her property. That's, that's my professional opinion of that. Um, but the plan does indicate the direction of flow uh, through this sure. whole wetland system, and it is all down towards the uh, two light road. Uh, there's evidence of drainage ditches within this wetland area. This is this is old agricultural land. I, I would not sub submit to you that anybody planted a whole lot down through the hollow of the worst of this wetland, the wettest of it. But clearly, uh, there is there is old agricultural activities all around us. Uh, the upland portions of this property at one time hence the stone walls and so forth, were all agricultural. Uh, much of, of, of the wetland in question that wants this special protection uh, has ditch lines in it, within it. So uh, I would submit to you that it's not 
that, that's an anecdotal explanation for why this, this is not a critical wetland designation. This, 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 this the wrong, that would be the wrong designation for this particular wetland. Um, they are, in fact, poorly drained soils, not very poorly drained. They're mineral soils predominantly. There was a small area of very poorly drained that I identified around the pond, but I believe it's less than uh, one acre that it needs to be. Before, which still constitutes an RP2 wetland. Any very poorly drained soil area, less than one acre, automatically falls to an RP2 designation. So it's even possible to have areas of very poorly drained soils within these bigger wetland areas that are RP2 and still not have the, the critical wetland one designation. Can I ask a question? How do you determine the boundary of the wetland? Once you've designated that it's indeed RP2 and not RP1, the extent of it. Then we fall back to the traditional three-parameter approach that's di uh, dictated by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Engineers Wetland Delineation Manual. What are it's, those? It's a three-parameter approach that is hydric soils, or soils that have generally exhibit a seasonal high water table within seven inches of the mineral surface uh, through the predominant, the larger portion of the year. Uh, number two would be wet hydrology. That would be evidence of wetness. That's the kind of the, the, the obvious visual, visual one. That would be strand lines of, of sediment that was left on tree trunks. That would be water stained leaves mm -hmm. in the, in the, with the lack of water. It would be standing water in the wetter times of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, the third parameter is uh, vegetation. And you need a predominance of hydrophytic vegetation or vegetation that is adapted for life in wetlands where those other parameters exist, wet soils and, and wet hydrology. Uh, and then you have within the vegetation parameter three echelons. You have the overstory, which is the trees. You have the shrub layer, which is 6 feet to 20 feet in height. And then you have everything that's non-woody that would be herbaceous. And you need dominance in all three of those as well to be able to say it meets the definition of a wetland. Gotcha. And what time of year did you do this? Well, that's a good question. I believe we were there in the fall of 2008. The plan is dated January. Uh, I was there before snow flew, and I saw this in the fall of the year. Mm -hmm. um, so late fall. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and, you know, when we're looking at hydric soils, these are, this is traditional, like, what I would say is evidence in the soil that takes at least decades, if not hundreds of years, to form. So it's not something that a wet day is going to look different than a dry day. These, this morphology of soil uh, that would indicate wetness features is something that's evidence over a long period of time. It doesn't just happen from a flash or a bad wet year. So you're saying as long as there's not snow on the ground, it doesn't matter what time of year. You oh, oh, absolutely, wetlands. absolutely, and and I'll be admitting to you that because we got bills to pay through the winter, we do some wetland delineation in the winter as well. Although we qualify it every which way, and we go back in the spring to reevaluate, so uh, we still do wetland delineation. This one is not that difficult. Not all sites are the same. This one has very abrupt boundaries over most of the site. I would say, with the exception of the area on lot four which has a softer or more gentle slope going down to the wetland mm -hmm. uh, from the building window. The rest of them are real abrupt boundaries. They're not head scratchers at all. And even with respect to that softer slope on lot four, I would submit to you, in, in my opinion, I probably delineated that on the comfortable or conservative side even because my coworker was kind of busting on me saying, gee, didn't, didn't you want to push that wetland line down further? And, and in that particular case, I said, no, this is thinking it might take a peer review. I don't know. It's Cape Elizabeth. I don't think it's in order, but it might take a peer review. We've been reviewed before. Uh, so that for the most part, these are very abrupt boundaries. People sometimes think of wetland delineation. You're looking for a line on a map. Oh, what is it by definition? It's a transition between the wettest and the driest. Mm -hmm. Uh, what we look for when we put a line on the map is the uppermost point in the landscape where those three parameters intersect. And that's, that's the way we arrive at that line. Thanks. Are you the appropriate person to explain why on lot four there is one place where the building envelope 
seems to abut the edge of the wetland? Yeah, yes, I could speak to that. There's a, there's a bit of a road opening there. We had a, a septic design up on that lot that uh, is up in that front right corner. Uh, there's kind of an opening already existing there. There's not a lot of vegetation there already. Mm -hmm. The idea was perhaps the board would be willing to allow a driveway at that location. I believe Maureen O'Meara's memo to the board even recognized that. Uh, it says here, the proposed building envelopes create a 25-foot setback from all RP2 wetlands with the exception of a small area on lot 4 where the driveway is expected to be located. The board may want to consider requiring that this area also incorporate the 25 foot wide buffer. However, the shift in the driveway location will likely result in the removal of trees that buffer the abutting property. That's, that's the reason why that's that way on lot four. But there are other places for that uh, septic system to go, so it's conceivable for the driveway to be located slightly differently than... I believe so. You mean, the, the abutter might lose some buffer, though. A and you What's that? The, the abutter may lose some buffer. Correct. Correct. That was the idea. I think that's what, what the planner had in mind. And that's Mr. Egan, correct? That's his lot next door. Correct. Next to four, yeah. 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 From the applicant's standpoint, and I don't know if this is for you or for me, does it matter either way, from the applicant's standpoint, whether to move the line and is there any other reason you want us to consider leaving it where, where you proposed? Well, it really functionally makes more sense to have the driveway there for a, for a number of reasons. In that the septic system fits better in the location there and the driveway fits better there. It provides buffering. Um, so if you if you move it if you move if you force the driveway to move over there's some topography issues there, there as well there's there's also there's steep slopes in there if you had a do you have a topographic plan some to we do if you had a topo plan it would better illustrate oh. the issue or the point that i think we're trying to make Yes, yes, that answered my question. Barbara, you have a question? <coughs> Maureen, we're doing a lot of talking about that lot line being 25 feet from the wetland. Would you please tell me where it says we have to be 25 feet from an RP2 wetland? You don't. Mm -hmm. um, Thank what you. What the ordinance says in the provisions, if the applicant was applying for an RP2, an, a resource protection permit, and you looked at those uh, permit standards, there's an explicit statement in the ordinance that says the planning board has the authority to establish buffers from RP2 wetlands. So you have clear authority to establish a buffer. The width of the buffer is at your discretion. And your practice in the past has, to, has been to establish a buffer based on the physical constraints of the site. There are some sites where you've actually created a 100-foot buffer because it was a very, very large site. There were sites where you've had a five or a 10 foot buffer because it was very constrained. You've probably used 25 feet more than anything else, but there's nothing magic about that number. Well, I'd like to say that if I were in a butter, I would like to save those trees because that would be a lot more important to me than where that driveway went. And I would want to have the trees it's not there. Even that long a stretch of the and it is not. However, I think nice. we, we could talk about requiring that the septic system stay at least 25 feet within the building envelopes, 25 feet from any wetland. I don't have any problem with number two personally because that has nothing to do with a wetland. Well, We're a little bit of that. And that, is, that restriction wouldn't affect this lot, four. No, it would not affect four. It's only three. 
that it affects? You're speaking of the setback for the septic system. For the septic system. Yeah, right. Because, I mean, the Conservation Commission did vote unanimously, the people that were there. And we're, not, think, we're not at that point, I don't think. No. Debating it, but, um, I, I but, but I, I'm cons I mean, here we're doing all this talking about this 25-foot setback for this driveway, and, and I don't know why exactly we're doing all the talking about it. Um, just to keep us moving in some order, the applicant's up responding to some of the concerns. You all, we've heard from several folks, Mr. Logan and the attorney. I've forgotten your name. I apologize. Uh, who, who else? Is, do you have any other any other things you want to say about what the some of the concerns the abutters were? Uh, no, I think we've, we've addressed all of them, and I think okay. you eloquently addressed the access issue as well. So, okay, the, the road access. Right, right. Okay, so so Barbara, you. You want to advance adopting the Conservation Commission's 25-foot? I would, but I'd like to go back before we do that sure. to, the, to the wetlands. I think that um, the applicant has hired a very reputable wetlands surveyor. And, I mean, none of us are wetlands surveyors here, and we have to take what both the experts say and what our town... Um, <clears throat> Uh, the town people, the experts in our town say too. And it seems to me that this was done very recently. And I know some people are having problems with their homes further down the road. But that doesn't necessarily mean that this part of the road is going to affect what happens in that part of the road. We spent a long time looking at the site. And the drop off is very, very steep going towards the farm behind it. And if, if the experts and reputable experts have recently done this survey and feel confident that they are mapping it as correctly as we can, or as they can, then I certainly am willing to accept their surveys. I mean, there's no way I can go out there and say, this is where the wetland is and this is where it isn't. Is the public hearing closed? Yes. The public hearing oh. yeah. No, All right. Uh, so I want to comment if, on that. If so, you have specific questions. No, for anyone, I know. I know. You can so um, I've lived in Cape Elizabeth for three years and know people whose basements have flooded mm -hmm. and who have horrific insect problems. And I've scratched my head and wondered how was it that these houses were allowed to be built here? Mm -hmm. And um, my guess is I would have the same questions about some of the homes that exist now on Hannaford Cove Road. And it's really interesting that this has come up. And um, b before it came up in our first workshop, I drove by there, and there was a ton of water on that lot. And I had the plan, and I thought, this is not a buildable lot. It's marginal at best, in my lay opinion. Mm -hmm. And um, so during our site walk, Jim, and I want Jim to address this, said there's normally water running through here. And it, uh, per my reading of our map, it was not even designated as RP2. And I think Jim crosses the Egan's property to access um, some hunting grounds. And um, so I'd love for you to comment on that. And it's, I would have no reason to question an expert delineation other, but for the fact of my own lay observation and Jim's comment. And um, I, it's, it's the planning board's job to balance the Egan State property rights. It, I, I take that very, very seriously. Um, but Barry. along with, well, I'm sorry, that very um, estate, thank you, <laughs> property rights, along with, um, uh, you know, good planning for the future and also uh, enforcing the ordinance. But I have a, a question about Lot 4, and I think it's interesting that Mr. Logan said that there is, um, uh, it's a, a, was more difficult to delineate Lot 4 than the other lots. And so um, I have a question about whether Lot 4 is really an appropriate lot for a home to be built on. Hold on just a second. I think, Jim, did you want to? <laughs> well, um, uh, Eliza was with me, and I crossed that. Um, I call it a, a, a creek. Um, I don't think technically it is, but there's always water running through there. Um, the area is located on there. Um, I share your concerns about Lot 4 being a buildable lot. Um, I have not analyzed the soils, so I, don't, I can't say technically. 
Um, I do know a good septic system designer can uh, make a system work pretty much anywhere he wants. Uh, so as far as the soil drainability. Um, but uh, my, I, I share your concerns. I guess that's as far as I can go right now. I would invite the uh, Mr. Logan. Did you want to respond to some of those uh, issues? Because that would be the lot I would buy. That, that's the, to me, that's the cream of all the whole subdivision. But why, why is that, though? I mean, in, in, in because it's got a nice, gentle, rising slope of upland. It provides for enough. Look at the topography. It provides for enough topography to get a positive building drain to dry a basement out if you wanted a full foundation there. Uh, there's ample room to put a septic system somewhere down slope of where the house would logically go, so gravity flow might be a possibility. Uh, the soils map shows uh, hollow soils. Those are shallow to bedrock. Those are going to be 20, probably 20 to 40 inches to ledge, uh, which in Cape is not bad, actually. Uh, but bigger piece of upland there than anywhere else on any of the other lots. It's about the healthiest of all the lots there are out there. So personally, I, I, I would, that would be my choice lot, with and no doubt. And, and as I understand it, and I'm just trying to get the facts straight, it's because of the east-northeast corner is up enough. Is that why you're making Correct. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because the building, the, the, I, I look at these kinds of things when I'm, and I, 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 I refer to the lay person here because clearly I, I've been doing this for 23 years and what, what leads the whole show is where does a house want to go first and foremost? And then how do the rest of the elements blend with that? That'd be a septic system. That'd be where you would drill a well in the event you didn't have the public water how you bring the public water line in, how you access the building with a window with a driveway, and how you pull and, and, and merge all those elements together to get what is a, a good building site uh, or, or a good construct, if you will. Uh, that lot, uh, that particular corner of the property, uh, has some of the best suitability that's out there. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so, so it's interesting to me to hear uh, the lay board members raising questions about what, in my estimation, technically is about the healthiest of all. So, so I'm, I'm, you know, that, that's a, one of the things not indicated well here is the topo. You notice they topoed only the upland, they didn't topo down into the wetland. But you would see a relatively flattening, if you will, at the bottom of that thing. And, and, uh, and in fact, there is a stream conduit through that wetland that's carrying the bulk of the water. So yes, there's a lot of water in a storm event that will overflow its banks. It's a relatively flat bottom. Uh, but for the most part, the, that stream channel, which the DEP regulates and has, uh, creates a 75-foot zone around it beyond what the town regulates, uh, is the conduit for most of the drainage water through that, through that site, which would continue unabated. So I, you know, I, would be, I would be selecting lot for for myself. If Would I you was point out the case. stream? Where is the stream on this? From the west side of that one, right? There's a pointer. The stream is on the... There's a laser pointer. The stream makes itself up. The, the, the surveyors pick the channel of it up. It's where the double line is there. Oh, okay. Across the line. Uh, so the next one. Okay. I understand there's a laser pointer on the table. Don't, don't. Uh, that is the drainage, see? Okay, that's... And it's flowing that's way away. that way. It, it outlets... The, see, the, see the little arrow there at the head of the culvert? The arrow shows the direction of flow. There's another one here that shows the direction of flow into the wetland system here. All the flow is this way. This way. If you went further down, you'd see the pond over in here. The pond is where it finally bottoms out and, and collects into the man-made thing. And then there's a ditch line out of that. The stream continues right through the pond. All the flow is this direction. It's not, it, it can't come, it is, this would be uphill if it was coming back this way. Why is there a conduit? Well, if, if you're going to be... I say the stream is the conduit. The stream channel is what's carrying the bulk of the water through that site. It's, it's, it's sir, sir. Flow. I'm, I'm happy to hear your questions, but you have to step up and identify yourself. 
But do you see the arrow there at the culvert head right there? It has an arrow head going that way, right in the there. And that's a culvert outlet that doesn't really have a scoured bottom and doesn't really make up the definition of the stream until you're further up into here. And then it's meeting the DEP definition. Now, if you look at that topo, there's um, a mound sort of at the bottom right-hand corner. That's and then, that right, right that's the, yeah. the high point. Yeah. And then if you go up from there, the land falls down, and, and, it, falls right. and then it falls back up. Right. Then it falls back up again. There's a stream right here, it and then it goes right up, and then it falls in the back over there. Exactly. That's and the lot line. along that seam, I believe, is where Jim right had here? observed right here? the yeah. seasonal Correct. Stream. It's a drainage ditch. It's an agricultural drainage ditch. I knew this was going to come up. You can't delineate a wetland. Uh, where a drainage this has been excavated in upland. What the intent was, whoever farmed this at one point, intended to drain this little pocket here, the one that crosses the lot line and is actually on the rear of Mr. Egan's lot. And there's a ditch, there's a, it's a man-made construct right in that hollow. And it was narrow and it was clearly excavated by man and it only runs when that pocketed wetland there, a huge storm event, reaches a certain elevation. There's no other outlet for it. They created something to try to get it to outlet into the bigger wetland system. So what happens then if there's a house built over where that ditch is and um, oh, I would hope that there's a would big put a rain house right where the ditch is, but nobody would ever put a house there. There would be a port design. It's like you never put a house down at the bottom of the hill. It's logical. But it is part of the building envelope. Correct. So well, there's no doubt. Somebody could. No doubt. Somebody, because it's upland, could fill the ditch and make it go away. Raise the grade. Somebody could put a culvert into it and let the flow go unobstructed and fill right across it and still get to use the land. But it's upland. It's not a regulatable thing. It's not a stream. It, it's not a river stream or brook by definition. It was a, a man-made construct to try to drain uh, a little depressional pocketed wetland into the bigger one. And my guess is probably it didn't work. It was fairly ineffectual because they probably ran into bedrock. They didn't want to blast. When, when, when they dug it out. When they dug it out. And it was because this, and that's what this tree line is, by the way. This is the remains of what was all an open farm field at one time. I, I would wager that if you went back on aerial photography early into the, you know, earlier part of this century, or early part of last century, I should say, probably what would be the 40s or something, that most of that was wide open agricultural field and there was no trees there at all. Uh, evidence of, of, of farming on that property and, and, you know, what was abutting. I don't know when this was divided off, but my guess is historically this piece probably was part of this bigger field in the back. This is a, you know, there is a little bit of a tree line here, but there's an opening, even a field opening right here. I don't know, you, you've hunted out across that way. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? There's yep. kind of a, an opening, and there's the end of the stone walls right there. Yep. Well, that evidence of that stone wall, that whole length of that, means that this was pastured at one time or farmed. And so I would suggest to you that that drainage entity, and, and that was somebody mentioned that to me, or, or when I heard that there was issues potentially over wetlands, I thought, oh, I wonder if it was that drainage ditch. And we have it on our wetland plan. We, we actually indicated the drainage ditch and what didn't come through on, on the survey plan because it's not a regulatable thing. But yeah, for sure, that's, that's a good point to, to be made. And there is a hollow there, and they did try to drain it. It didn't work. Thank you. Um, you can step up to the microphone. Just very briefly, mm. um, as I listened to the last speaker, okay. it was clear that perhaps I didn't make myself plain. Um, if, just for the record, could you just state your name again? Pardon me, my name is Florence Craft, number 69, Hannah Pacovo. Um, all the water in the wetlands, which are on the west side of Halliford Cove Road, do not run uh, to two lights. And, and if that was the impression you finished up with, that's incorrect. Okay. Um, some of the wetlands runs in the other direction, down toward Hanover Cove Road. I know the direction of the wetlands that runs behind my house. <laughs> I know where the drains are. So somewhere along that road, there is a switch off. 
My theory, when I raised the question about the whole water system behind there, was that either there's a point at which one wetland goes west and the other goes east, or it's an integrated system. Mm. I believe it's an integrated system. That is my concern when we go into terrific detail on any particular plan. I'm just concerned that the hydrology of the area is being disregarded because we're nickel and diming all the little bits of the land. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Quickly. Go ahead, you can step up. I'm assuming all the comments in that one was are directed to the issues that we've been discussing and not new issues. The, the public hearing is closed, but the, the chair has discretion to address the issues that, were, that have been. It's just a response. To Go ahead, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, with all due respect, Mr. Logan, you know, I, I've been lit a litigator for 19 years, and I've defended uh, the depositions of hydrologists, and I've taken the depositions of hydrologists on the same case, and they've had very different opinions. Mm. I mean, and I think that it bears repeating that a peer review is not something that a professional should be uh, afraid of. They should welcome it. We do it in academia, we do it all the, all the time. And uh, I think some of the, his comments tonight. I have no trouble with that. I mean, I've sat on this board where after peer review, there are generally talented people who make mistakes once in a while. Absolutely. I don't think and he did. And, and I, I never thought the mistakes that we've identified were done on purpose. I mean, I, Absolutely I would not. hope not. And I had sometimes, and, and some of it is a question of opinion. I'm, but go ahead. And I don't think Mr. Logan's claiming that he's infallible. Yeah, fair. I mean, cer certainly not. Uh, and I, I heard two board members say that they, you know, accepted his opinion that he's a reputable expert. I don't know. For all I know, he's either the most meticulous soil scientist in the state of Maine or the sloppiest. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I've never looked at his CV. Mm -hmm. I've never talked to his peers uh, around the state. Uh, he might have done a fantastic job but here. He might not have. So I think it bears uh, peer review. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Okay. I think we, uh, we need to move the meeting along and to make some decisions about which way we're proceeding. Um, I put out the issue of peer review. What do we want to ask for peer review of this work? I think we need to either fairly put it on the table. I mean, it's, we have about as explicitly asking for it. Um, I think we need to hash it out and either come to a consensus that we do or we don't or put it to an outright motion and vote. And since the chair can't make that motion, I would uh, ask somebody to either put one out there, positive or negatively. Well, I, I just want to say one more thing. I feel sure. like there's a good chance that uh, if it were to come under peer review, um, the results would be confirmed. And mm. perhaps the issue I have is actually with the ordinance as it's written. Sure. Allowing development like this to happen. Sure. But we need to follow the ordinance. Well, I agree with that, but I, does that make you more or less inclined to ask for the peer review, or since it seems pointless, less inclined? Less inclined. But, um, I anyway, think I just the, want to throw that out there. Again, you repeating my thoughts or th thinking the same thing. I, I know not all the lots. I know that lot four fairly well. Um, I know how it drains. Um, I'm not sure. You, know, you say it's your favorite lot. We will agree, agree to disagree on that. Um, but I think the results of a peer review will be the same. Um, they've, I think they've done a good job of showing where it's wet. Um, none of them are RP1 wetlands. So at this point, I'm not inclined to ask for a peer review. But others may, may disagree with me on that. I guess I would agree with those. So, I mean, in terms of whether we're going to put it out there for an explicit vote or a consensus, I mean, if the motion were to come up to ask for it, I would vote no. And if it, so that's three. I'm assuming. Do we have? I've I've heard the discussion on the on the road just to bring that back up, and um, I understand it hasn't been put forward. Um, have we ever? I guess Maureen. I know I've asked this question on other subjects. Have, what have we done before, as far as? Uh, it, do we put restrictions like that on, on land, or is that within our proof? Well, you, you get a couple of problems, frankly. Uh, any, any condition you put on any approval, a subsequent applicant could ask you to remove the restriction. So 
if you would be likely to remove the restriction, that may have some influence on how willing you are to put it on there in the first place. That's, I think, one problem. The second problem is that, frankly, your subdivision standards are pushing you in the exact opposite direction. The subdivision standards don't say try not to have connections. I remember you saying that. It, it, it encourages it, it us. Does, to it actually says that, you know, general standards of subdivision design section A, the proposed road conform to the comprehensive plan as adopted or whole in part by the town council. There's no proposed road. Uh, the second sentence is, the board may require provision for the projection of roads or for access to adjoining property, whether subdivided or not. So in fact, the practice of the board, in accordance with your ordinance, has been to ask for applicants to lay out rights of way to abutting vacant land. In this case, the applicant's not proposing to do so, and at this time, the planning board has not suggested that they want that. So if you were to put a restriction on using that land as, as a road, one, I question if someone was really motivated how, how far it would go. Mm -hmm. And two, I would question how consistent it is with your standards. Mm -hmm. um, and I know there was another one, but I just lost it. <laughs> well, I mean, they can come and ask for it to be changed if it's part of a new proposal. The third point is, in fact, in the, there is nothing that I have seen from anyone to suggest there's any proposal for any subdivision of road anywhere there. Mm -hmm. But the assembly of land and having multiple lots to create a subdivision is a classic method of development. Understood. Yeah, I, I would clearly come down on it. It's not a good idea to put that in here now. I can't hear you, Peter. I, I would come clearly down on the, I, I, would, I would not want a restriction on it at this point. I mean, I just think it ties the board's hands going forward. So, and I think it's not good planning. I mean, it's not about the abutters. It's not about this particular applicant. It's what's good planning for the town of Cape Elizabeth. And leaving that restriction off this approval right now, in, to me, is clearly good planning. I would agree. I, I think what's not good for Cape Elizabeth is if we start putting restrictions or making demands on applicants based on speculation. Right. And that's really what we've got here. I understand the juxtaposition of these lots to the Holt's very large property. I get where people are looking at it and going, ho, ho, but it's speculation, and we just we can't do that. I think that opens the door for a number of ill-advised moves. Unintended consequences. Unintended consequences, right. One of the other issues we want to, do we want to discuss is the, the restriction that the Conservation Commission is asking us to put on this before we... Yeah, I printed that out and left it at the office. What did it say again? Well, it says it, it, what they're recommending is that as part of a condition of approval, if we get to that point, is that the septic system be located within the building envelope in a minimum of 25 feet from the RP2 wetlands. Um, and, and the developer, I think, is clearly asking us not to impose either one of those for the reasons you identified on lots two and three. Um, I, I personally am not inclined to do it under any circumstances or for the building envelope, I think it's fair to consider, and I'm just not sure where I want to land on this, to, to put a minimum of 25 feet uh, from the RP2 uh, wetlands. I mean, because I because that, that would only affect lot three. Do I have that correctly? Mm -hmm. and, and lot three. I'm sorry? And lot four in that one spot where the driveway is. And not the septic. No, that's the septic system. The septic. It's a septic. Yeah. My apologies. Yeah. So it only affect lot three, and I did understand that it could be movable. You just haven't had a chance to. Yeah, could you step up and just address it, just so I get the facts straight before I take a position? Well, the long and short of it is that 25 feet is an arbitrary number, right? And all, and we're meeting all the other guidelines put forth here, all the other suggestions of the 25 feet from the west. And we're asking for this one area to allow us an additional five feet so we can put the septic system in the location where it was designed. Which may move anyway. Which could potentially move. But it would at least give us that flexibility in the event that it could not. You know it goes, can go there. Because we know it can go there. So we're at, and we understand your concerns and the, and the 25 feet from the white land. But in this one location where it's, 20 feet, another arbitrary number, from an area of wetland that's 
arguably, as Jim had pointed out, less critical because it, it is in that location that's just downstream from the culvert. Without introducing too much complexity, if we put this condition on there and accepted that one site out, so if it did get moved, it didn't move closer. Do you understand what I'm asking for? Right. Is that, was that something the applicant can live with? That's right. Do you understand say what say that again. We put the condition on, and we took lot three and said they can put it where they're proposing on lot three and lot mm -hmm. three only. So that if somebody bought lot three, wanted to design a different system, it's not going to slide any closer. I guess I'm not so con I mean, they can put a septic system anywhere. I, I and understand it's, that, It's Jim. an arbitrary number. It's not based on engineering. And uh, I, I also see on this board that we don't get asked to do this by the CONCOM too often. Yeah. That's why I'm just inclined to at least what I view as an, an appropriate protection to try to imp impose is the wrong word, to, to uh, accommodate that as much as we can. And the developer is telling us they can live with that sort of yeah, public condition. Well, if they can live with it, I guess uh, if it was a deal breaker, then I would not right. want to accept the condition because it's, what you, what uh, you? It, it doesn't matter. Um, but if that's not going to mess them up and it's going to make the Conservation Commission Happy. Okay. I guess, Peter, I, part, what you say about we, that we rarely do this for the Conservation Commission makes me concerned that we're doing it in this case because the Conservation oh, Commission you. has not given us any explanation as to why this septic system and this wetland sure. are any different than any other RP2 wetland anywhere else in Cape Elizabeth. And this is not something we routinely do here. So I would think if we were to impose that condition here, we would need a lot more information as to why this is a unique property and we uniquely need to do it here when we don't do it town-wide. Yeah, Elaine, Elaine's taken the words right out of my mouth. That You're was what I was just about I, to I say. Guess, yeah, maybe we put our back up on this one. Well, Maureen wants I, to address that, I think. When's the last time you had a septic system with a subdivision? You don't hear this from the Conservation Commission because almost all your new subdivisions are on public sewer. But is the, is the Conservation Commission really proposing that what we ought to be doing is putting into effect a new ordinance which says that if you have a subdivision with a septic system, it has to be within 25 feet? Because if that's not what they're doing, then I don't think there's a basis for doing it here. And we're not legislating. And so it's, it has a bit, sounds to me like sort of a spot regulation. I, I agree. They didn't have access to the experts or the, you know, the skilled people the way we did to explain the depth of the soil um, in that particular location. And it, perhaps the depth is more important than the proximity to the wetland. Well, and the fact of the matter is that there's, there's a state plumbing code for this very exact reason, so that septic systems are put in appropriate places, and that's what we've done. And I think I think that's what we we in my opinion that's what we need to default to. We need to default to the if regulations I, that are I in could. place. I mean, in defense of the Conservation Commission, in my opinion, they are very consistent. Every single plan that they see, they look at the wetlands and they are always promoting setbacks from the wetlands because they understand that a vegetated buffer tends to filter whatever's coming from the developed area for the runoff that's heading toward the wetland. In this case, they looked at septic systems, one, because it's a fairly low level of development. There are no roads, so the only real impact was the septic system. The second reason is we don't see them that often. And the third reason is, frankly, these septic systems really can move anywhere. Because under the, what you have right in front of you now, there's no restriction on where that septic system can be except the state plumbing code. And the town of Cape Elizabeth has made it very clear over 20 years of wetland regulation that they feel a lot more strongly about wetland protection than the state does. Whether or not the state plumbing code is adequate or not, but I believe, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but under the state plumbing code you could get as close as 10 feet to the edge of the wetland? Is that correct? Under the state plumbing code, in certain instances, yes, yes, that, that would be the case. You would be able to construct the system really, quite frankly, as long as you so the toe of the slope could stop six inches from the edge of the buffer, and that and that was why the planning, the conservation commission was recommending a minimum buffer, and I think they were just trying to be consistent with what the town's long-standing policy has been for wetland regulation. We need to change our ordinance then. 
I think the ordinance has been written so that it gives some flexibility. Um, there have been places where you've had a project before you where you have approved a five or a ten foot buffer and the Conservation Commission has supported that because that was the most that could be obtained and still meet the needs of the applicant. So the, the current ordinance provides you with some flexibility. If you want to make it harder, uh, a harder, faster, brighter line, certainly that's something that the Planning Board can discuss as recommendations. I, I have a question about um, septic systems because I'm not familiar with them. When you build a septic, do you clear all the vegetation off, all the trees, and do you keep it in that state, clear it off? No vegetation, no trees above the septic? No. I'm not familiar with when, when it's finished, when, it's get, yeah. when it gets its finished grade, the prohibition is to keep any woody vegetation off of the system proper. And that beyond that, uh, plantings are, are per perfectly okay. But just you can't plant right over the top of the system. The toes of the fill, the bottoms of the fill slopes, all those can be vegetated and, and they can remain as a buffer. It really boils down to just not the state plumbing code prohibiting the establishment of woody trees or shrubs on the system itself. And, and, and it's usually thought to be due to invasive roots, which would typically be maple trees and willow trees. But because there's this concept of any woody root can invade a pipe, and maples and willows are known for it among all, uh, it, they, the state has blanketed and, and made a prohibition for, for all 40 state. And quite frankly, it isn't even once the system's built. People plant trees all the time on their leach beds. There's no prohibition, I should say. There's, there's no regulatory prohibition to it. In order to prep a site to build a system, yes, you need to clear the entire area and grub and stump all the trees from the system proper. And it's fill shoulder around the edges of it. The toe okay. of the fill as you grade, grade, grade out toward the original grades, that, that's a different story. That doesn't take the same amount of, of grubbing and, and, and stump, stumping. The, the reason I bring that up is because um, we are talking about uh, the wetlands and the runoff, and um, buffers would prevent some of that runoff going into the um, wetlands. And um, I was thinking about how clearing off that land, when you have the plants, they serve as a webbing and they'll hold the soil in place. Um, they're good erosion control. control. Uh, they absorb excess water. Um, I was just thinking that it's good to have a buffer, it, that that's what you want, um, and that'll keep the um, sheet of runoff going into these wetlands. It might help with some of the concerns around would there be flooding or not. So I'm concerned about having a buffer. So you would be in favor of at least that restriction? I probably would just to make sure that you sure. don't have the... Uh, and you're willing to live with that one minor that they could put it there, but if they moved it, it couldn't get any closer. I mean, the developer's offering that, so I've, I've, I've kind of swung both ways on this. We, I, think I we wouldn't want it any closer. Sure. Most definitely. But I do want to see some buffering on all the lots to keep, make sure. Um, right around, we have a building, um, you have the building lot, and I like to see some buffering around that. Like to maintain that with um, making sure that the, the natural vegetation stays and it's undisturbed, um, things like along those lines. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other comments, questions? I actually, if I may, sure. another item. Um, the ordinance calls for setting monuments at the front property corners. However, if you look on your on lots front of lots two, three, and four, that's where the road comes up and where the easement is. What we would propose to do is to actually set the granite monuments at the back of that five-foot easement that we're intending to I have no trouble give, with that. give to the town. I don't. It doesn't make it is otherwise a particular reason into the pavement. We should be concerned about that? No. I, I think Mr. Titcomb is proposing a practical solution. I thought he was going to say forget them completely, but that's, <laughs> I wouldn't have been in favor of that, but that's, that's fine. I mean, well, it's as, a, as a surveyor, I think there should be markers there. So. Well, that's right. <laughs> Sometimes you're trying to save a few nickels. And, but any other questions or comments? I'm, tr I'm trying to gauge w what the general consensus is on the Conservation Commission 
um, recommendation so I can make an appropriate motion. Well, we may. Um, well, my, my thought would be, in the past, we occasionally look at the conditions and vote on those one at a time. In other words, we move through a potentially an approval. We can vote individually on the, uh, the conditions. The conditions. Well, and some of them might be rather agreed, like they decided to pay the impact fee. And that's one of the conditions. But I don't think there's going to be any debate. Right. That's what we're going to accept. Barbara? <clears throat> as far as the 25-foot uh, buffer, since these are proposed sites, I actually think it's a good idea to have the buffer in there. And <clears throat> lot, lot three, all they have to do is rotate the thing to get the five to 25 feet. It's on an angle. I, 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 I'm, and, yeah. I mean, sometimes you say other people have spent time at this and they've thought about it. And I don't see that it's a big deal to say you have to be 25 feet from the wetland with the septic systems. They have plenty of building envelope. I, I, I just say it's not based on, in my opinion, any engineering facts. It just yeah. because they want to be more conservative, in my opinion. You mean the CONCOM? What's that? The Conservation Commission. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes being conservative isn't bad. Well, I don't know. We're going to set up. Sometimes it is. Well, it's the setting a precedent that concerns me too. Just, yeah. You know, if this is something that's, if this is something that's appropriate in every given situation, then I think Liza's comment about looking at the ordinance rather than the flexibility may be the way to go. I, I, that's the difficulty that I have with it. This may be something you just put on the table as a vote, take the vote and move on. Yeah. So, are we? Is the consensus then to go with the 25 feet rather than or exclusive of the restriction to stay inside the building envelope? I have no right. desire to oppose a building envelope restriction at no, all. I don't think anybody does. You do oppose it or you don't oppose it? Oh. I, they're asking us to impose an additional condition. Right. Two of them, really. Two of them, really. Yeah. Right. The first one is locate the septic system within the building envelope. I'm not inclined to do that under any circumstances. Okay. Like I think that seems to be a consensus. I, I don't yeah. think that's a problem. That, or at least it's a majority, which is we can spare ourselves about. So the, the only additional condition we, it seems to me that we need to put on the table for a motion and a vote is to impose a condition that the septic system be located uh, within a minimum of 25 feet from the RP2 wetlands. And my request would be to accept lot three from that, that they could put the proposed system there, but then if they moved it, it would have to comply with the other condition. So in order to figure a way to just move this forward, my thought would be to go through the motion that's been proposed by the town planner, um, go through the first five or six items, mm. six items, and then propose the last one as a condition and put the last one out to a separate vote as a motion. Does that seem like an appropriate procedure? So what we need is first would be a motion. Um, oh, I'm trying to think of how to do that. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to think of. What you could do is just make the motion that you would be willing to vote for. And anyone who doesn't agree with it can well, make no. a, an amendment to a condition. And then you can vote on the amendment to any condition, and then you, whatever the way that goes, you then have a set of conditions if you can vote on the full motion. Does that make sense? No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Can I, yeah, can I make does a question me. on the um, well, septic setback? I, I guess I'm, I'm concerned without an ordinance of putting a hard and fast 25-foot rule here. And I, what I would be more inclined to say is that the proposed septic systems as shown would be approved. But if the septic system is anywhere else, it either needs to be 25 feet away from the edge of the RP2 wetland, or it requires specific approval. In other words, to put it any closer than 25 feet, the applicant would have to come back to us so that we're not establishing a new standard that's not in the ordinance, but we're leaving it within our discretion, taking the advice of the Conservation Commission. Well, not as a hard rule, but as an, as an opportunity to come back. I always have that right, though. 
I mean, you can always come back and amend. Of course they can. Yeah. They can always come back and amend anything. Yeah, yeah. But I think rather than, because I, I agree that this 25 feet is kind of arbitrary. And so I'm not comfortable imposing something that sounds more like a, a 25 feet limitation here without having more information on why that's where we've arbitrarily put it, as opposed to the 21 feet, which is where it is on lot three. But you're saying that if they put it where they've proposed today. If they put it where they proposed today on any of these lots, that's fine. I don't think we need to necessarily distinguish But if they move three. it. If they move it, it either has to be no closer than 25 feet, or they have to come back and give us a chance to take a look at it. That's, that's much more elegant than when I was scrawling. I like that. Can you repeat? <laughs> yeah. no. um, and I wanted to make one comment before we vote on the access road to the Holt property or anywhere else. Um, I would have very serious concerns were anyone to come through with a subdivision that was bringing any significant amount of traffic onto Hannaford Cove Road. It's clearly not set up for that. Um, and it, I would take an awful lot of convincing to approve something like that. On the other hand, I don't think that's before us now, and I don't think it's appropriate to put it on this plan. But I agree with all of the neighbors that the end of Hannaford Cove Road is not a good pass-through for any significant amount of new traffic. But we have no idea what might be proposed for a pass-through. And if there were a single residence back there, and there were you know, cars attributable to one more residence, maybe so. If you get to three or four residences, maybe not. But I think before we put a, a hard and fast rule, we need to know what the factual situation is that we're actually looking at. We don't know that. It is speculative. So I would think it would be inappropriate to do it now. Okay. Beth, are you uh, in any position to <laughs> try to propose I'm going to try. I have a motion for the board to consider. Okay. Finding of facts. One, the estate of Henry Berry III is requesting minor subdivision review of a four-lot subdivision on a nine-acre lot located at 110 Two Lights Road and Hannaford Cove Road, which requires review under Section 16-2-3, Minor Subdivision Review. Two, the town engineer has identified engineering details which should be added to the plans. Three, the applicant has agreed to pay an open space impact fee in the amount of $13,365 to meet the subdivision ordinance open space standard. I'm a little can you add to that that it's paid before construction starts not with the findings of fact we can't we can add it as a condition uh, I think it's under five it is is it? next page oh. yeah I think it's I think it's already under the conditions right. um, I'm not sure about four that stays. Does it stay? Four, the plans include delineation of building envelopes which are intended to restrict activities on the lot. Five, the subdivision plan includes the preparation of easement deeds, the final language of which is still under development by the town and applicant's attorneys. Six, lots two to four include underdrain flat swales to capture stormwater. These swales are designed with a top layer of soil medium and would aesthetically and functionally be enhanced by landscaping. And seven, the applicant has substantially addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance section 16-3-1. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the estate of Henry Berry III for minor subdivision review of a four-lot subdivision on a nine-acre lot located at 110 Two Lights Road and Hannaford Cove Road be approved subject to the following conditions. One, the plans be revised to address the recommendations in the town engineer's letter dated January 13, 2010. Two, that a note be added to the plans stating that if the septic systems are moved from the locations as shown on the plans, they must be located within a minimum of 25 feet of RP2 wetlands. 
Three, that easement deeds be submitted in a form acceptable to the town attorney and town manager and signed by the applicant. Four, that a landscaping plan be submitted for installation over the soil medium and the flat swales. Five, that prior to the issuance of the building permit and or commencement of construction, that the full amount of the open space impact fee for the subdivision, which would be 13365 be paid to the town. And six, that the plans be revised and submitted to the town planner for review and approval prior to recording the subdivision plat. Beth, before I ask for a second, yeah. I do think we also need two as written I agree. as a seven. We need two as written as a seven. All right. New six. Mm -hmm. As a new six. All right. So six will be that a note be added to the plans restricting activities outside the building envelope to the installation of driveways and utilities. Right. Mm -hmm. And seven will be that the plans be revised and submitted to the town planner for review and approval prior to recording the subdivision plat. May I make a request? I think you do need number two, but because of what you, the, the old number two that's now number six. Yep. But because of what you wrote for a septic system, I think you need to amend it slightly. It says that an OP added to the plans restricting activities outside the building on to the installation of driveways, common utilities, utilities, and septic systems as shown on the approved subdivision plan. Okay. Can we so amend that? Your motion. My motion. Yes. All right. Yeah, but then you need the 25 feet. So we? That's already there, though. Yeah. The 25 feet's already there. Can you reread your new number two? Can I reread my new number two? Yeah. With the 25 feet. My new number two was that a note be added to the plans noting that if the septic, septic systems are moved from the locations as shown on the plan, they must be located within a minimum of 25 feet of RP2 wetlands. Within a minimum? Not closer. Feet. Not, not closer. Not closer. Not closer than 25 feet. Are we somewhat we clear? The motion? Do we understand the motion? That's more important. Well, before we move to a request for seconds, <laughs> everybody understands the motion's on the table. Okay. Do I hear a second? Liza. Somebody dared. A motion having been made by Beth Richardson for approval with the conditions she stated and seconded by Eliza Quinn. Do I have any debate on the motion? I would just propose that at the end of number two, we add unless otherwise approved by the planning board. So that it's a minimum of 25 feet away from the edge of the RP2 wetland unless otherwise approved by the planning board. I guess I left that off thinking that if it wasn't within 25, it would have to come back anyway. Yeah, it would be an amended. It would be an amendment or request to an approved subdivision. Oh, okay. And that, and that, okay. That's why I left. In order to do something different than what you have an approval for, you have, have to, to ask okay. permission. Yeah. I follow that. So okay. that's okay. And it's just no. redundant. That's why I'd rather leave it off. Okay. Any other debate or requests on the motion in the second? Well, he uh, he clearly met all the the. Uh, rules here but my gut feeling is we'll be looking at this again when somebody does want to put a road through so well, and I, 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 I guess I would echo Elaine's comments on that that's right you know, there's nothing in front of us there's nothing factual but yes that's and, my but I'm gonna be looking awful hard at that and yeah. I, I don't see Hennepin Cove Road as it exists no. now but there's so many variables on that well, there is the and I understand I just wanted that to be out there any other debate no. <laughs> on the motion okay hearing none those in favor of the motion those opposed to the motion, the motion carries 7 up. Thank you. We're going to take a five-minute recess. I have it scribbled. Let, let me just write it down for you. I've got it scribbled. I've got it scribbled.
to how to run this thing. Oh, okay. So stay in this little <laughs> corner right here. You'll do better. Apparently, it doesn't. The next make item on the agenda. Excuse me, right? Yeah. We have like a little flag issue. Uh, you just something you like. The mics are open. It, and there it is. Okay. Now yours, like most of them. Look to see how this shows up on the internet. <laughs> Yeah, the next item on the agenda is the Woodlands uh, Assisted so Living People's Site Plan. If you want to excuse, excuse us. Excuse us. Excuse us. That will allow you to zoom in. Hey, Jim. This will allow you to change your view. Yeah. If, the, if the folks who aren't here for the present proposal can clear the room, we'll some other business to take okay. I know everybody's very patient. I see the town plan is trying to I'll be right there. Technical and then the issues like work out. And, then sure. here's your uh, and as soon as the applicant's like ready, and I'll take it back step up to the microphone and okay. 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 Oh, we're time management. And then <laughs> 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 see it right there. Yep. You're up. Hello. <laughs> um, we've met before. I'm Peter Bethanis, architect, and I'm representing uh, Mr. Walters. Um, we have a little change of plans, and that uh, three of us flew back from Florida. Two of us made it, the other one's still hovering, so it's Mr. Thayer. So Mr. Clooney from uh, Mr. Thayer's office will be talking to you about all the site work stuff. Um, it's their expertise. Um, I will give you an overview of what we're uh, trying to do. The project is located on uh, 126 Scott Dyer Road. Uh, presently it exists of uh, Two buildings, one uh, the old Viking nursing home, and uh, it's a one-story building which we propose to raise, and a two-story building which we propose to turn into a 72-unit uh, Alzheimer facility. We propose uh, to make that building. Uh, like two separate buildings, the first floor and the second floor, that will work independently, uh, both having uh, grade entrances and exits that uh, will be accomplished by a proposed ramp and parking area for the second floor. Um, you can see that right there. This is the proposed ramp that comes up. Um, and then there will be an entrance right up there for the second floor, which you would uh, access the whole second floor from that, giving it a grade level entrance. The first floor um, has also has a new entrance. So 
I'll have to uh, bear with me. I'm not used to using my fingers. I'm used to using a mouse. On the same drawing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it so says, it says one or four. Or four. This is the uh, actually the first floor plan, um, and it is the northern part of the floor plan. You notice that line right there. The building is so large, I had to make two drawings as opposed to one. I know that may be a, a problem for you to see, but uh, if you have a question, you can let me know. This right here, this part of that drawing, is the existing building. We propose a new kitchen right there, new entry, and a training and education area for the employees. Um, there, that area is accessed, and Mr. Clooney will talk to you more about this uh, by a driveway right here, and then over here is the ramp going up. The kitchen was put in this area because we previously talked about it at the workshop. We cannot put anything on the uh, west side of the building because of wetland issues and you know, that's why it's, you know, it's not over there anymore. Yeah. This is uh, the identical drawing that you have in front of you. There are two elevators in this building. We will probably we will be having a discussion about the elevator later on, I'm sure. When you come through the entrance, right here, there's a, a waiting area and the administrative offices, and then you go into the facility itself, which on this floor has 36 uh, uh, patients, if you will, and they're in uh, various rooms, either two to a room or one to a room. That's shown on the drawings. There's a dining area, general dining area, and living room. And um, I would have to, again, change this plan to show you the other side, but it, if you want me to do that, I will, but it's very similar. It's just double corridor rooms, and uh, you have it in front of you. Um, I will talk to you about something that um, I haven't talked to you about before. I can get this thing to work. This is the first floor plan uh, south. You will notice that I have a new storage area uh, denoted right here. This is on your plans, but it, 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 and I only mentioned it on, and at the workshop. I didn't actually have it designed. Mm -hmm. um, it is designed now, and it is in the actual footprint of the existing building that will be raised. That part of it, that's the very end of it. It doesn't extend beyond it in any place at all. Um, so it, it's a storage area there, and it is under the deck for the second floor uh, part of the building where the Alzheimer's patients will go out so they can go outside um, without using an elevator to come down and then you just don't have the, the room to put something on the first down on the grade because it's too hard to take 36 patients up and down an elevator. Uh, it, it just doesn't work well. That's 
why we have this. Now let me uh, go up to the uh, second floor. And we'll talk about that. Okay. What you have here is uh, an architectural problem. Um, if, if you will, we have uh, Alzheimer patients who want to leave the building on their own. So it, it becomes a problem for um, the people who assist them in this building and also for uh, the designers to design something that works. What I've designed here is a um, an outside courtyard that has a surround of what looks like walls and what they are they're they actually replace what would normally be the fence if it were down on the grade and since this is a story about the grade there is a problem in that the Alzheimer patient can attempt to climb over a fence uh, they really some of them really try to leave the, the facility so when you look at that you say well how do you make this design work so that it's it's nice for a person and it, it doesn't appear like a fence and it, we can't have barbed wire over the top of it so they can't get out stuff like that so what i've done is i've created walls with windows that will have lexan they will be able to see out there is no roof that's open, but there is a roof that runs around the perimeter of this that acts as a, if you will, this is the wall, this is the roof. So the patient can scale this wall if he wants, but he can't really go out and, and go around and over top of the overhang. It's going to send out three or four feet. So, um, back, back into the unit. He, pardon me? The arc goes back in. It comes back in, yes. And so the patient won't be able to scale that. He can scale the wall, but he cannot get over it. All the benches and any kind of chairs or anything like that that are, that are in this uh, space, if you will, will be bolted down so that they cannot take them and go over and try to, to get out. And plus, there's someone there all the time watching anyway. But, uh, can you show me exactly where that is in that room? Pardon me? Where are the plans exactly are you describing? Where are the benches? No, the whole complex you just described. The whole, the whole outdoor room. Right there. Okay. And that is in the uh, exact size of the existing foundation that is that is there under the existing building. Okay. Uh, that's the only new thing that I had that I hadn't gone over with you and I wanted to explain that to you how it you know how it functions there is a door directly out of that space right there I have to treat this as if it were a room or a building and, and this is uh, basically a place of assembly so I have to have a direct exit right out of that place of assembly and it goes right out onto uh, the parking area. So it is a grade level exit. There's also an, an entrance to that uh, space from the facility right there. That's where the people would come. They would come through this living area and then go out into what is a screen porch in that area and then they exit and go out and walk around. Okay, so that's basically the, the uh, building itself. Like I say, that floor has another 36 patients on it. There are two elevators that you can access the first floor from the second floor with, and they will be used for transporting things like food and that kind of stuff. Um, I think at this time I would like uh, Mr. Clooney to go over issues as far as and uh, wetlands and that kind of stuff, unless you have some specific questions about the building. I have, you understand this is on for completeness this evening, correct? Pardon me? You understand that the project, it's on for completeness. Right. We only have one narrow determination tonight, and then I'm going to hopefully be setting a public hearing for this. Um, do you have a copy of some of the issues and concerns? That you yes. 
the, uh, the, um, the, the town planner has in, in her memo. Yep. Do you want to address those now? Yes. Okay. Okay, under summary of completeness. Right. Uh, Mr. Clooney has put on his plans the actual dimensions for setbacks. So that's number seven. Item number seven. Item number seven. Okay, okay so we're going to have that one corrected, correct? Mm -hmm. Next, next. Item thirteen. Plans include landscaping plans does include a plant list but not specific species of planting. I believe that's been done now. That's done. Okay. Uh, landscaping plan refers to a four foot by nine foot illuminated facility sign, but no details of the sign have been submitted. We have that submitted now. Okay. And the town manager. Hold, hold on, hold on. Just to avoid potential confusion, I believe what you're suggesting is that in your next submission you'll include all this information? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's not in yet, so to speak. Right. The, the applicant was willing to bring new plans tonight. I encourage them not to show you brand new plans that you hadn't seen yeah, before, but rather to promise to bring it next month. Yep. Good. Okay. Okay, number 16. Number 16. Um, town manager is awaiting information to be provided him by the applicant regarding the determination of financial completeness. I believe that has been done this evening. Um, my client has. I have verbal instructions from the manager. Um, I believe he asked for two items. Um, I, we've received one, one really big one. Um, the other thing he did ask for was uh, just a letter from a financial financial institution asserting the status of the applicant. Does this sound familiar? It's my understanding that he, he told me this afternoon he had asked for that and he had not received it as of 3 o'clock this afternoon. Yes. What, uh, if you could identify yourself for the record. Uh, Lon Walters. Uh, what, would the, what would the letter say? The letter of credit, right? I, I really would to, to say that the project that they were going to give me the six million or it's it. I believe the manager is looking for something that attests to the financial stability or the financial capacity of the applicant. But what and would that? What does that translate to? I'm not going to dictate what the letter could say. I, I, something I really think you and the manager but it's ought to. hard for me to go and get the letter without having a better idea. I think, I think what Maureen is suggesting, town planner is suggesting, is that if you, if you get in touch with the town manager directly after this procedure and ask him specifically what he's looking for rather than having her dictate what it's going to say. Or that guess. Would, or guess. <laughs> uh, that would be a more efficient way to get it done. I mean, this is, this is not unusual. We, we get these all the time. And um, CAPE has, I think, a very efficient procedure where the town manager handles that. And it, it, it ensures confidentiality to you, which is one of the reasons I think it's a good procedure. Uh, but we're, we're satisfied that the applicant does have some capability of actually pursuing the project, even if they choose not to, like the prior applicant. <laughs> uh, fortunately, you know, it wasn't like half finished, it just sat there the same state. So uh, we just want to make sure that if you get started, we have some capacity to reach and finish or at least ensure the safety of what is unfinished. So, but again, talk to the town manager about the, what exactly he's looking for. Um, he probably could send you an example, but I'm not going to speak for him. Um, is that a fair summary? Mm. Anything else on that issue? Any questions on that issue? No. Okay. We gotta move on to some more. So page two uh, are a little more complicated issues, some of them. Um, the name change. Did you see that comment? I think it's mostly because of safety confusion, potential safety confusion. Uh, 
Well, those, those four items were for completeness, I believe, right? The, yeah. the next yes. group of items are for discussion after. You're right. I, I apologize. Go ahead. Yes. Do you want to consider a motion? No. Would you consider a motion? Sure. Um, I have a motion for the board to consider for completeness. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Woodlands Assisted Living of Cape Elizabeth LLC for site plan review of the redevelopment of the vacant facility located at 126 Scott Dyer Road to a 72-bed assisted living facility be deemed complete. Second. Uh, I want to maybe amend that. Be deemed complete pending inclusion of items 7, 13, 15, and 16 of the site plan submissions checklist. What do you guys think of that? Well, here's how we traditionally handle that. Yeah. Um, I don't like conditional completeness. I'd um, rather have the applicant understand it's their risk. Um, that if they're going forward on a complete plan, gotcha. and right. they show up yeah. next month without items 7, 13, 15, 16, <laughs> there's a pretty good chance they're going to get outright denied. Okay, gotcha, thanks. As long as the applicant, these, are, <laughs> these strike me as fairly minor issues. Yeah. Okay. If they were wholesale major changes, I would say we should deem it right. incomplete. That makes sense. I would lobby to to uh, vote no on the motion. Yep. But in this particular case, uh, I think given those parameters, I would, I would be more comfortable leaving it as an unconditional completeness. Right. Issue. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. So yours is not a second. You have a question. Yes. Yep. Beth sec uh, made the motion. Barbara, you have a second for the motion? Second. Okay. A motion for completeness having been made and second made by Beth Richardson and, and seconded by Barbara Schenkel. Any debate or discussion on the motion? Beyond license. <laughs> Uh, hearing none, all in favor of the motion? All opposed to the motion. That was uh, Elaine. So it's 6 1. No, I was, I was in favor. I was oh, sorry. I was just spacing out on something. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, in favor. Thank you. I did. <laughs> I'm glad you did. I apologize. I, I That's all right. It. All right. So the motion carries 7 0. So we've deemed the matter complete. And before we set it for hearing, do we want to have a discussion on some of these items, or do you want to set it for hearing first? Let's go through discussion the first. Okay. Um, so the first item is the name change, since we deemed your application complete. I think I would like um, my, uh, my client to address that. We discussed it quite a bit, and he has his reasons for wanting to keep the name the way it is. Um, my, my understanding is that the ordinance says that you can't have two streets with the same name and that's that's the extent of the ordinance and I'm, I'm not an expert uh, but that's my that's my understanding and so this doesn't involve uh, you know a duplicate name you know we're not presenting a, a street with the same name as an existing street um, so I guess that's that's one response um, you know, it's sort of a technical kind of a when I not when I say legal, you know, I'm just no. It's you know, clearly according to the ordinance. It's kind of you know, if you stick with the ordinance, then it's not you know, we're okay. Um, the other, the, you know, the other issue is we've got uh, we're in five other locations around the state, and uh, you know, the name that we've kind of branded Woodlands Assisted Living um, is the name of all of our facilities, all of our locations around the state. Um, and that is our uh, legal, uh, you know, our uh, corporate name here in Cape Elizabeth. It's Woodlands Assisted Living uh, of Cape Elizabeth LLC. So, you know, I'm, I'm reluctant or resistive to, you know, changing it. Um, I guess that's my, you know, my response. I got to tell you, this is a difficult question for me because I think your, your reasons are quite legitimate. I think the technical legal issue, I, I don't. It, it's about safety, fire safety response. Um, the branding issue, I think, is a legitimate concern. I just have to weigh that against uh, the potential for a, a bad call. Are you, are, are you, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, E91. 
What, what's, what's the 911 system? E 911. Enhanced 911. It, it identifies the, uh, the caller. As far as I know. It does. Yeah. So yes. I, it's I less, less of a risk. Yeah, well. I don't understand, you know, you know that, that there could be tremendous confusion. You know, if, if we're calling from Woodlands Assisted Living at 126 Scott Dyer Road. I understand that, but as I understand it, We've, we've outsourced our dispatch now, correct? Yeah. That's I, number I, one. Our two. dispatch is in Portland now, and it's dispatching to a volunteer on-call uh, rescue unit. And they're the I, Right. And my guess is that any time they hear Woodlands, they're going to fly down you guys because that's where most of their traffic is going to come from. And if someone at the Woodland Apartments needs them, there's a good chance that they may not go to the right place first. And the police chief is saying it's, it's a four-minute difference. So they arrive at your facility. Oops. We were supposed Eight to go to the Woodland Department. 14-minute difference, four-mile difference. Yeah. 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 That's, that's the concern. And it's a so big there's, one. It's yeah. a big one. So there's, there's the perfect reality, and then there's, you know, what happens when people are doing their job and they moving inadvertently quickly. go to the wrong well, place. You move, try to move quickly. Well, I'd be, I'd be hoping to have them change their name. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, would, I, would, I would object to that. I don't know. Is that they have a? Is that their? They have that name registered, or is that a? It's not a legal issue. <laughs> I don't know how else to say that. I'm just, I'm just yanking on you a little bit. Um, I don't know what to say. It is a big deal for us, and I think you can appreciate that. I absolutely do. But yeah, I also we, appreciate, I appreciate the person who lives in the woodlands predicament. Yeah, we have people. They, they're looking at 20 minutes as they're grasping their chest, or, yeah. or worse, they're watching somebody else grasp their chest. And uh, yeah. where did the where did the rescue go? It's down at the assisted living facility. You're going to rise to the top, and I. I would think I would think though that there's other duplicate or similar. Conflicting names within the 911 call area. Well, when we adopted that system five or six years ago, I know they've done their best to erase or change all those. We we sort of been over that hump, and we're trying not to let it happen again. Mm -hmm. um, I am absolutely sensitive to the fact that you invested a, 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 an appropriate amount into in, some branding here, but I, I I think we may have a this could be an issue, a major issue, and I don't you know. I agree that, that, that I think we have to take into account the safety issue right at the top, and I think that is within our jurisdiction to consider. It is a public safety issue. And I would just ask before you come back again, if you would give some thought to maintaining your corporate um, identity with your other projects in the state, but coming up with another way for the common name of this particular facility um, to be described so that it's not just the woodlands because I think if we already have that in Cape Elizabeth and our police chief is telling us that we have a danger here then we can't simply ignore that because you have, a, you have facilities in other towns that you would like to continue with this name. I think that would become a significant problem so I would ask you before coming back to think of some creative ways that this could be commonly referred to as something other than the woodlands. Okay. <laughs> what can you say? Very well put. We're moving on. Um, number two are uh, engineers' comments. Um, I, I would like to go to number three and stick with this page. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, number three is a question that the fire chief asked about um, upgrading the elevator to the. Uh, the new code which allows the size to be greater so that you can use a, a stretcher or a gurney. And uh, I have a comment on that. We're going to the trouble to have a grade level entrance at the second floor and that grade level entrance can be accessed by um, emergency vehicles. So I, I can't, number one, um, 
I can't fathom why the emergency people would go into the first floor and go up an elevator and then get someone and come back down an elevator when they can go to the grade level entrance um, that we're creating with the equipment and the truck, go right in the door, no elevator, right at the same level, go right to the room and take them out right on the grade level. Uh, we provided that, or we're trying to provide a safe access for uh, fire apparatus or emergency apparatus to access that second floor. Um, and when I went to the fire marshal with this plan, they um, liked it very much for that reason. We don't really have to transport people up and down elevators in an emergency. Um, in an emergency. There's a grade level entrance where the truck is. So I guess I'm confused as to why the fire chief would want to transport um, patients up and down an elevator when he can go right out the grate to the truck. That's my same, answer to that. I have the same impression. Okay. So that, that's my answer to that right point. now. Uh, whether there should be more discussion or not, I guess that's up to you people. But we're providing a grade level uh, well, that, entrance and exit. That actually seems reasonable. I mean, if they go to the wrong entrance, the crew goes in and say, they can radio and say, move the truck upstairs, that's where we're coming out. Well, the thing is, there's, there's an engineering question here that asks, or maybe it was the fire chief, I think it's one of the further down on the list, um, to name uh, the, the rooms by floor, which we do anyway. Um, obviously, if it's first floor, it starts with one, 100. The second floor, it's 200. So when the call comes in, it automatically tells you what floor it is so the truck knows to go to what entrance. So, I mean, that would all be taken care of. Anyway, that's how I feel about that. Um, the RP1 buffer construction, within the RP1 buffer, three new areas of paving are proposed for parking lot, parking lot drives, and air conditioning. Pad. Um, I can show you one. Bob, is that one here? I'm going to put that up on there. While he's getting that up there, another point in uh, Section 3 here was the relocation of the hydrant. Do you have any problem with that? The relocation of the hydrant, that was also under number three. We're prepared to put the hydrant wherever the chief wants it. Okay. okay. That, that's not an issue. Okay. Um, one more. Mm -hmm. we got to keep going. Okay. I think I can do it. Well, 
part right here, this this piece. Yeah. He would have he would like to extend that that big so he can turn around easy. Right, right now it's right there. So if we extend that, we extend it into the wetlands. Now that you know that's not something we want to do. It's something that if you, we were requested. So I don't think we can do it. He, he would have had that issue at the Viking, the previous zone. That, the previous that's exactly zone, he right. He would have been able to turn around. That's what, okay, that's one thing. Yeah. Now, this other piece that's down here, yeah. that's a mistake on the drawing. We don't want it. <laughs> so that's right. gone. Those are the three issues. Okay. That's the three things. Oh, one more. Oh, the air conditioning pad. The air conditioning, uh, the air conditioning pad. Okay, you need to help me with that. Where did you want the air conditioning pad? I, I think it's right. It may go there, or it may go at the end of the building. Down here. Yeah. We, yeah, yeah. we, we can't go down the end of the building. So. Okay. Or. Let me point once. I get the play of this. 
I'm sorry. Uh, let me introduce this. Is yeah, could you identify I'm David Walters. David Walters is the uh, general contractor for the project, and Lon Walters is his brother. And I have the steadiest hand of anyone so far tonight. Very impressive. That's Thank because you very he didn't have to fly. So, so tell us what you, what you Perhaps <laughs> there. That wouldn't, that wouldn't require any kind of... Yes, it does. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. Where's the north arrow on this thing? I lost my... Right up the page. points out. This is, this is south. That's anything, south. Anything on the south side, there's a blue arc. If you scroll up just a little bit, you can see the blue arc. I can see it right there. <laughs> Too far. Can I have your laser pointer? There it is. Can I have the laser pointer for a moment? What is it? Your laser pointer. Ooh. So. Okay. There's a blue line. Right in here? Actually, where is it? It's right there. It goes right across the pad, concrete pad. Right, and anything below that blue line, which you can't see from here, can't be new. It has to use an existing footprint, or it's within a buffer, it's new, impervious surface, and it's not allowed. Structures, roads. So where you well, find that blue, like, see that little blue line? Mm. You just, anything south of it? That means the whole road? No, the road's no, existing. The road is just, oh, the road it's, the new, it's the new proposals we've come to through the environment. Okay. We've got one more. I got Structure they're proposing, which is the concrete pad for the EAC unit okay. on the roughly um, southwest so corner. We're just going to have to locate it somewhere that's, that's fine. out of that zone. You're, you're on the record right here, and I just want to make sure we. We can just move it up. Yeah, you know, it doesn't need to be moved that far, but I think they have to set up issues with moving it. Yeah. North. But I, I, I leave it to your creativity to come up with an appropriate spot. Okay. Uh, number That's six. What you're going to do? Number six. The south elevation. Some clarification may be needed for a roof deck structure. I think I went over that and explained to you what that is about. Yeah. Okay. Does anyone take a offense to that or have a problem with what I said? No, I think the the issue here was. Well, that's the issue. They're asking. It's okay. a room and what. Okay. I I'm reread the question, yes. I have no issue. Does anyone else on the board no. need, need any further clarification on that? No, the explanation. Okay, so. great. Now we're up to the ramp. Okay, uh, number seven is the ramp. Um, yeah, he's not there yet. With two things, we're going to go back to two and if, five. If you will, you look at the ramp and the parking area and then take a look at the building that we're removing. The building that we're removing causes much more of a hazard in every every respect from fire to safety to to vision. I mean, the building we're removing is almost 250 feet long and 20 feet high. So the ramp and its and its parking area is a much much less of an impact visually um, than the building that we're taking away. So I guess I take issue with the that it is a, an eight-foot barrier in the middle of the site, but we're removing a giant barrier from the middle of the site, and that's being replaced by something that is um, going to be used for life safety, and, and taking away something is a real problem for life safety, the way I see that building. Okay. I've heard what you said. Maureen, what, what are the issues with that? Because I'm not... It's well, part of it was how the snow was snow effectively removed from that ramp and cleared out of the way so that it remains a broad enough passage. And I, I think it, it's just asking for what your snow removal plan is so that that roadway remains accessible because since it goes up, uh, there's a, no obvious place to put the snow. That's, an, that's another part of this. We are going to have to remove the snow from the ramp and the parking areas. It will have to be removed because if it isn't, some of it, if it gets to the point where it spills off the ramp, it will fall onto cars. So, I mean, it's going to have to be physically removed. So I guess we'll just need some kind of a note or plan on that. Is that how that would normally be done? And then the question about pedestrian circulation for people who park next to the south access road? That's right. And we, we have added onto the plans already a walkway that goes from that area across the ramp and then 
so they can access uh, that there, there was no walk at, there was no walk at one time there is now it's it's right up there so that'll be on the next package of that'll papers. be on we'll the next that. i guess okay. it will okay so we're going to go we're going to go through the engineer's letter now the engineer's letter the engineer's letter Yes. You went over items number two and five. Two, yes, I'll get to that. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, number one. Of, of the uh, engineer's letter basically is just saying that he's reviewed it. Um, number two, he agrees with the stormwater analysis. And there is a reduction, we know that. And then he mentions the snow on the ramp, which I said we are going to remove. No, excuse me. That's A. Hold on, we have a question. Um, it's more than just saying you're going to remove it. I, I suggest that you have some kind of a plan for removing it that you submit. Yes, to absolutely. I agree. So that we can look at it too. Right. Okay, so then um, going down to item B, we, that's the, we've that's included great. the walk. That's what we were talking about the access pedestrians from the 16 parking spaces in the east of the site. We've done that. Um, How about the catch basins? Yep, I'll we see. have agreed to put a catch basin on each side. Um, there will also be, a, when you see the final thing, there'll be catch basins in the deck area of the um, second floor deck that we talked about, because that will be a green roof. That's going to be a side structure up there, so it has to be drained. So we're going to run a line and pick all of that up, and you'll see that. Catch base and manhole adjacent to the yep, retaining wall. We're doing that. Okay, and understanding that the existing catch base in 102 will be removed as a new building addition is proposed over the catch basin. Yes, the applicant shall call out catch basin 102 as being removed on the grading plan and note the connection. I believe we've done that. But what it is, is there's a catch basin that one of the additions is on top of. We obviously had, we're moving that. We're, we're doing that, that'll be done. Here's that existing four inch and six inch roof leaders drain into existing catch basins and are shown with the abbreviation SD on the plans. The applicant should clarify the difference between a leader and a storm drain in the legend and on the plans. That will be done. The applicant has provided this number G. The applicant has provided spot rate. Detail, detail in most areas of the site. However, the applicant may consider additional, adding additional spot grades to the grading plan in the area described as subcatchment 3.2 to show how the surface water will drain to catch basin number 101. We will do that where we have done it already. Uh, H. Uh, the floodplain is shown in a different location on the TEC plans than on the August 3rd, 2009 Sebago Techniques plan approved by the board. The applicant should confirm the actual location of the floodplain on the plans so that any potential effects of the site plan can be assessed. Um, I think I would like Mr. Clooney to comment on that. We are. Um, having that reviewed by the state planning office and we're waiting for is that the one we're waiting for a letter for no no a little more than that. what's that a little, a little more than that. 
If you could step up and address yeah. that. That's also... Uh, I know my five. Name, my name is Bob Clooney. I'm with Fair Engineering. You could speak up. The mics are just not picking you okay. up. Uh, if you lower the lid of the laptop, it might be a little easier. The mic's in front of the lid of the laptop. Yeah. Pull it forward. The lid. The lid? Yeah, because the mic's behind it. <laughs> That's why we're not hearing, among other reasons. Uh. <laughs> Go ahead. Speak loudly. Okay. Um, the, um, we're working with uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency on uh, resolving the location of the flood zone in this area. Um, what the current um, uh, flood zone map shows the 100-year flood line running uh, with the He's got it. It's a you push just push button. it in, the little button at the end. There's a, near the top. There you go. Aim it the right way. The the flood zone line, as shown on the FEMA mapping, comes down through the building and down this way to the south. Um, and it's shown on the flood zone map as a, a zone um, A, flood zone A, which is a 100-year flood zone, but they don't have a, um, an elevation. They don't know what the elevation is that the water rises to in that 100-year flood zone. However, some, um, and that's the existing map, which was published in 1985. Um, recently, uh, the state planning office um, and FEMA have been working to um, come up with an actual elevation that that flood, the 100-year flood would get up to in this area. And they've got a map out now that's um, it's preliminary, but they've come up with a, they've determined that, um, that the elevation of the flood uh, level in this area is elevation nine feet. Uh, and the nine feet is somewhere in this, right along the brook, and it may extend up to about here. It doesn't go uh, inland from the brook uh, uh, hardly at all. It hugs the brook all the way down to the south boundary. Um, but in this, prelim in this preliminary map that they have prepared that they show the zone as being AE with an elevation of nine. They have also left on the old, in addition to that, they left on the old zoning line. So technically, it's still in the shaded area of the flood maps, which means it's in the flood zone. Um, so what we've done, we've been in contact with uh, FEMA and the state planning office, and what the way to get around this or to resolve this issue is to file a letter of map amendment where we um, show where the flood, where elevation nine is on this particular site and uh, request that they remove um, the rest of the site from the flood zone area. And uh, we've been told that uh, we'll, like I say, we're working with the state planning office and FEMA together and uh, the contact we have at the state planning office is going to be in direct contact with FEMA through this process so that as soon as they um, allow this map amendment to occur, um, he will pass that information on to us and, and uh, let us know that that's going to happen. And it should happen before the next meeting, I've been told. And that would take them out of I was wondering if they, I mean, if, if everyone's in agreement that the flood elevation is elevation 9, and you have topography that shows flood elevation 9, would it be possible in your next submission to actually map the flood elevation line rather than the, what we all seem to agree is the incorrect flood mapping line? Right, yes. Which would, I think, keep things a lot cleaner. Right. And I believe this is what the planning board accepted from the prior applicant. 
Right, and, we, and we've been told that this is, um, preliminarily, that this is going to happen. It's not like it's going to be a big, um, a difficult process. It's a simple process. Right. I'm not saying to stop doing what you're doing, but no. I'm, but and then when, but I'm saying you, this is going to happen. Do what I'm suggesting, then you, you're you're running independent of the deadlines and the time constraints that you may run at the state and federal level. Right. So we can show that on the ninth. And in, in what I'm telling, what I'm hearing is that that will happen. So we are we're not jumping the gun here and coming up with something. Um, Unreasonable. That's it's something that the themer is going to agree to do, from what we've been told. To I just don't see how Murray, we're that. Murray, long. what you're saying for the, our next meeting to show the floodplain at elevation nine. Right. I'm, I'm for, suggesting you put a line on there that says the flood elevation line. Yeah. And not put the other line on there, so that what you're labeling is accurately labeled and that you're not putting information on there that everyone seems to agree is not accurate. And I just don't see how wherever FEMA, what if, wherever FEMA comes up with where the line should be will affect the outcome of our decisions. It, 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 it does, though, because if the flood elevation, the 100-year floodplain is actually a zoning district, uh -huh. Uh, well, it's in some places it's a zoning district. In this, this area, it's not a zoning district, but a whole new floodplain ordinance kicks in whenever you're in the floodplain. And for example, you're not supposed to be building new structures in the 100-year floodplain. So the stuff we just went through with the RP1 buffer and removing things, we start to have a huge problem with if this shows that the whole lower half of the building is in the floodplain. Yeah, but but they're removing a building that's in the floodplain. So I understand, but on a net basis. But, but there's nothing in that strip. ordinance that does the net basis. I mean, for sure, there are some ordinances that allow you the net basis kind of approach, but I don't really think the floodplain does. I mean, they, they'd have to actually show that they're, for, they're, every single new structure that they're building would have to, they'd have to demonstrate that the, the, the lowest elevation of the building is a, one foot above the flood. Flood elevation. So, I basically have. I have to raise the floor out of the floodplain. Your your training room is gone. A bunch of olive oil. Yeah. And, um, you're you're in the floodplain, but you're out. The floodplain goes around it, and you're up out of it. And, and what it would do to this? It would, it would really put a crunch on the handicap accessibility to the building and stuff like that. So the elevation nine is going to end up being the elevation of the floodplain, and our floor is like. 21. Yeah. I mean, we're nowhere near it, so it, it, it's not, for me, it's not an issue. I think for Mr. Thayer, it's an issue because he really has to present um, correctly where the floodplain is and the elevation of it is. Right now, there is an error. Just where the elevation is. Well, we know, where the, we know where the elevation is, but we have a line on a drawing that it doesn't really mean anything, but it does. I mean, it's a, it's a problem for Mr. Thayer because there is a floodplain area shown on, on a document that he's accessed. Am I saying it right? Yeah, that's right. I am saying it right. I mean, Mr. Thayer is, is, has a liability there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So I don't know what you want us to do about that one at this point. We are doing, going through the proper channels to resolve the issue, and it's supposed to be resolved before the next meeting. I understand. Next, so that, that's uh, letter item H on the town engineer's letter, as well as our, uh, we have one more issue, which is letter I on the town engineer's letter. The applicant shall confirm that the existing 10-inch storm drains that are currently under <coughs> buildings and those that are designed to remain under buildings are structurally sound and convey water as designed. It may also be beneficial at this time to consider rerouting of drain lines during the reconstruction of the site to avoid building areas. Uh, we're going to do that as much as we can, but uh, some of it can't be avoided because 
we simply have to go under some of the buildings to get to the area where we can drain it. It's there. Some of it is already there. Um, and I have to go under the, uh, there will be a line that's going to run underneath the uh, new parking area, the raised parking area, and right underneath of the, the new deck for the Alzheimer on the second floor. I, I can't avoid it. So, and they'll, certainly they'll be designed to support the loads or whatever is required. That's, that's done all the time. So, we don't like to run things under buildings either, but when you don't have a choice, then you just design for that. I don't, I don't have a, there's not a problem with that. Really Do you have a problem with that? I just think they need to talk to the town of and they can call them directly and find out what they need for information on the plan so that they can proceed. Evaluate with it. it. Sure. Yep. Right. Okay, okay. Uh, number three. Uh, the canopies were removed. Um, the last time we had a workshop, I had removed the canopies, but apparently the drawing that the engineer had, the canopies were still left on for the building. They're gone, so there is no issue there. Okay. We're up to the last page, item number four. I'm looking for it. You said you put the fire hydrants any place the chief wanted yep. today, so. That's right. Item four? Hydrants. Pardon me? Oh, it's also fire hydrants. It's also the sprinkler system beside the hydrants. That's right. Thank you. But that's, yeah, that's part of the fire. Right. Item five. <coughs> but we have a letter from the public works. You do have a letter from the public works, George? We have a letter from the public works. Well, on this particular issue, the f it's going to handle the flows? Public works. Yeah. Well, they yeah. want the gallery. Water treatment appears to be able to handle the flow. All right. The development has requested public Maureen's works. Maureen is confirmed. will need to supply to. anticipated gallon issues. We've done that. And yeah, Maureen is telling me the letter exists. We've done, we've done that. Okay. Six. Six. The applicant shall dimension the proposed curb radii on the plans. Yes, we will. I heard this. The plans show three handicapped spaces. The handicapped spark, uh, parking sign should be detailed on that will be done. <coughs> Number eight, it should be noted that the applicant is proposing to relocate the dumpster to the front of the site allowing it to be closer to the new kitchen addition. The applicant should provide a detail of the fence screening, the dumpster from Scott Dyer Road. It's already been done, so yes, we're doing that. Okay. Um, number nine, the applicant should show the location of temporary gravel construction entrance, exit on the plans. <coughs> we're not going to have a temporary gravel. We won't have one. We'll be using the black top that's there. Okay. Ten. Ten. Um, the paved walkway cross section detail shows the thickness of the pavement to be one inch. We recommend the designer to increase the thickness to two inches. That's a done deal. Okay. okay. Do you have any problems with any of it at this point? <laughs> Well, what, 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 one of the wonderful things is th this is all on video, what you just did. Okay. Well, it, I, I it, even better, it's on the internet. So if you forget what you agreed to do, go watch yourself on television. Now, so we've gone through the engineer's letter, we've gone through all the discussion items. Are there any other questions, requests, comments the board has of the applicant? I have a request. Um, I'd like to have the floor plans for um, the second floor to have the um, 
everything labeled. The first floor is labeled, all the bedrooms, how many uh, patients will be in each room. Can I get that for the second floor, each room labeled? We had acted, that had come up in one of the workshop sessions. And oh. he went, no, it's okay, because Victoria's on the board. Um, but why don't you give her the, the explanation for that that you gave us? For the lack of detail on the second floor. The detail, there was no detail on the second floor. That's your Alzheimer's unit, right? There is detail on the second floor. I thought you, you had explained to us earlier that you wanted to reserve that for... Juan, Juan looks like he wants to say... Um, it, are, you asking, are you asking just that they be labeled with how many beds are in each room and, and what the room numbers are? Or? Yes. Second. Oh, okay. Is that, is that all you're asking for? Yes, second yeah. floor, uh, none of the rooms are labeled. That'll, that'll be but I would like to know how many... Um, bedrooms and how many patients will be yep. in each bedroom. Yep. Sure. Is that fine? You have an idea of where that's going right uh, now? That's all. That's, we okay. can do that. Because you had left that open the last time we right. talked. Right. Yeah, since then, things have evolved a little bit since then. That's fair. Yep. So you will have that for us the next time. Yes. Week. Great. Great. I had a second question. Go ahead. Um, I wasn't sure what this means. The proposed development will reroute the current underground connection to existing overhead utilities along Scott Dyer Road. Layperson, I'm not sure what that means. Are you going to put... to run the power lines in a different direction. Oh, so you're not using overhead lines? You're still using underground? I'm just concerned if anything happened to a pole. I mean, I don't understand exactly what that wording is. Yeah, they're underground. Oh, I can't remember where I found it now. Does that ring any bells? The proposed development will reroute the current underground connection to existing overhead utilities? Yeah, they, I think they're taking power from one of the poles and they're running it underground. They must be, I don't remember seeing that, must be just moving it. I think that's what, is that what you're saying? Okay, yeah. I just wasn't clear if, Where did um, you read that from? Yeah. Um, oh, those are your notes. Your yeah, these are my notes that I took on. Um, so I could... No, that's I don't want you to get that. <laughs> I would like to see that in the plan somewhere. Go ahead. I just wasn't sure what that means. I want to make sure everything's still, if it is underground, that it'll continue to be underground. When they say overhead, it comes from the street now from overhead, mm -hmm. underground, and we're going to reroute that from the street, which is overhead, underground, to a different location, because the building will be gone. So it stays mm -hmm. We just have we'll to bring the underground the utilities into the, the uh, two-story building. Okay, I want to make sure. So, but it doesn't change anything visually. Um, yeah, it's, okay. it's still underground. Right. The concern is you didn't want overhead drops to this place. You want My concern is the safety with all right. those patients. Right. I don't want anything. I wasn't sure if it was a pole and somebody hits the pole, a car hits it, and there's no electricity for all these patients. Yeah, we can't control central main power and, you know, the, the poles are along the road. But on it comes from the city street. Okay. Underground right. to our ser our electrical service and the water will be rerouted also, but it it uh, doesn't change anything. It's just where it ends up. Okay. Well, you'd have a generator though, and there's backup generators. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. You all set? That's it. Yeah. Any other questions of board members of the app? Does the applicant have any questions of the board? <laughs> What, what, what is the date of the next meeting? Well, that's our next motion to consider. <laughs> right. Yeah, the question is, do we want a site walk? <laughs> I've seen the facility the last time, so I... I yeah, I did too, so I did too. I'm all set. I'm all set. Well, the consensus is we don't want a site walk. We don't even need a vote on that then. So the, the only question then is we need a motion to table. It would be our February 16th, 2010 meeting. Is that the correct date for the meeting? Yeah, we, we decided not to push it out one more week because there's enough of us who are going to be around that vacation, vacation week. I have a motion for the board to consider? Please. <laughs> be it ordered that the above application be tabled to the regular February 16th, 2010 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing will be held. Second. Motion having been made by Beth Richardson, seconded by Jim Hubner. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion? Motion carries 7 nothing. 
So we will see you the 16th. Is there going to be any problems with getting all this data to us by when, Maureen? January 30th. That's a lot of work. It's essentially 11 days. Oh, I don't know. Are you guys all set? All set? Okay. Well, I want to know now because if we don't get it till two, a week before, it's not going to be yeah. on that meeting. Yeah. No, but, we should be fine. Well, that's fine. It sounded like a lot of it is already done. It's just a matter of printing it and submitting it. Fair? Is that right? You're correct. Yeah. Okay. A any other questions? When we, yeah, when, we, when we come in for that meeting, what should we be prepared to do? Do we need to make a presentation? Yes. So we should. That's do the first time the public will have an opportunity. Okay. To ask so we should do the full, the full thing. Right, but I don't think you need to go into detail, you know, because we we've heard it before, an overview of it, and then be prepared to ask, answer question any questions. Okay. I mean, I think you saw the earlier presentation uh, for the four lot subdivision. That's the kind of initial presentation I think we see in a public hearing mm -hmm. typically. Uh, and then, you know, sort of the detail comes out in the questions that he, the board asks or the public asks. Okay. If, if I can just add to that, you want to be sure to mention anything that you have not yet done that has been recommended by the town engineer or um, the town or by it. We haven't recommended anything specifically when you're making that presentation. Should, should pick up on all the items that, yes, that uh, were raised. Yeah. Well, I don't know that you need to pick up on all of the major ones. Yeah, but you do want to say we've addressed this by that, whatever we went over today that you said that will be done. I want to hear that it was done. Mm -hmm. It's part of the presentation. Right. Or it's not because you like our name and we're going to have an issue there. <laughs> or not. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't, I haven't figured that one out yet. Well, I know that. That's why I raised it right now. Because, uh, that's going to be right up front, I think, quite candidly, one way or the other. So it's a tough one. It is a tough one. Yeah, I give you that much. Okay, you all set? Yep, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your oh, hard work. May I add one more thing? You know, one thing you might want to consider is keeping that as sort of a tagline, but having something above it that will become the name of the center. You know, it's, it's funny with the name, the, the first facility that I did up in Waterville, it started out and it was the Woodlands. That was just the name of the facility because it was going to be built in the woods. We relocated to another site in the middle of a field. And it was we still stuck the with the Woodlands. But then as we added to it, we added two more components and we called one of them Evergreen. We called out the other one Park Residences. And now we're just all over the place with what people call us. And that's part of the reason we changed the Woodland I, Assisted I Living. Understand. But you know, we may be able to we may be able to do something that I, I know what you're saying. You know. Will you uh, Walters at Woodlands. <laughs> Pardon? Walters. Walters Brothers at Woodlands. Yeah. <laughs> Joe. Okay. Anyway, good luck with that. <laughs> we have we have a couple more items. <laughs> Thanks an awful lot. The other one. Excuse us. Can you move? You need, you, move, you need to move out. Okay, the next item on our agenda is the uh, Winnick, Wood, Winnick Woods parking lot site amendment. We're looking to uh, amend the previously approved Winnick Woods parking lot site plan to remove two conditions on the approval. Do I have a motion from the board? Sure, I'll take a motion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, motion for the board to consider, be it ordered that based on the request and other materials submitted and the facts presented, the request of, of the town of Cape Elizabeth to amend the approval for the Winnick Woods parking lot site plan to remove conditions relating to hours of use of the trail and dog leashing be approved. A second on the motion. A motion having been made by Liza Quinn and seconded by Ruth Richardson. Do I have any discussion on the motion? Go ahead. I have a question. This talks about removing all reference to dogs being leashed, but then somewhere else they talk about requiring that dogs be leashed up to a certain point. 
Should we not leave in it the requirement that the dogs be leashed until they reach a particular bridge? That was one of our initial. Go ahead. The Conservation Commission was willing to work on a specific leashing provision for Winnick Woods, but the council is asking you to delay doing anything with that and allow them to put together an open space management plan where they can look at leashing and a myriad of other issues as part of the overall management of town land in Cape Elizabeth. So they would prefer that as a planning matter, you leave it open, but understanding that they intend as part of the overall plan to require to regulate it to, to, to look at the issue and come up with a policy yeah. that would that Uniform. would apply townwide. Okay. All set. Mm -hmm. Any other debate, questions, comments, thoughts, suggestions on the motion? Mm -hmm. Well, I have a question. Um, you have any idea how long that's going to take, Maureen? I met with the town council liaison on the open space and the Greenbelt management plan this afternoon at 1 o'clock. We have an outline that I'll be working on with the manager and the liaison and bringing it back to the Conservation Commission next month. Sounds fairly short. Yeah, good. This is fine. Any other questions, comments, thoughts, suggestions? Motion on the floor. All in favor of the motion? All opposed. Motion carries 7-0. Uh, next item on the agenda is the um, Triple Cultural Amendments. The Town Council is forwarded to the Planning Board a request to prepare amendments to the Zoning Ordinance that implement recommendation in the Comprehensive Plan re relating to promoting agriculture. I have a motion for the Board to consider? Please. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Be it ordered that based on the draft amendments and the facts presented, the agricultural amendments are tabled to the regular February 16, 2010 planning board meeting at which time a public hearing will be held. Second. Second. <laughs> Uniformly seconded. <laughs> <laughs> Discussion, debate, thoughts, comments, suggestions on the motion? None. Hearing none, all in favor of the motion. And we'll, we'll, we'll see the crowd here on. <laughs> One, more. One more. One more item? There is. Adjourn. No. Oh. Could I move, oh. Mr. Chair, could I move that we adjourn? Yes. Second. All in favor? Aye. <laughs> Yeah, we knew he got you know, you knew it as soon as it came back. Yeah,